Hello and welcome back guys. Glad to see you around. Make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. This is Book of the Dead, Chapter 16. The frontier of the Western Province had a reputation for breeding hard folk. There was little in the way of law out here. The various farmsteads and villages left to fend for themselves more often than not. When three burly looking farmhands stepped out of the trees around him, Tyron was quick to throw his hands in the air and try to look as harmless as possible. Which was quite simple considering he was alone and unarmed. Hello there, he tried to force a smile through the greasy feeling of fear that bloomed in his stomach. The three weren't interested in talking. Instead they advanced on him from three sides with their hands raised. Getting robbed was not part of his plans for this part of his journey. But it wasn't exactly something he hadn't considered would happen. Although he hadn't expected his first experience with it would be at the hands of farmers. They beat him, not too badly all things considered, before they shook him down. Frustrated at not finding any further coin, they beat him again, worse this time, before they left him lying in the dirt. Tyron gingerly felt his ribs one by one, wincing when he prodded any sore spots. He didn't think anything was broken, he might have gotten off lucky there. Working a physical class like they did, meant they had plenty of strength. Perhaps only his unusually high constitution for being so low level saved him from worse injury. After 10 minutes of resting and gathering his breath, he forced himself to stand and took stock of the damage. Most of the food he'd bought was ruined, though crucially, not the water. He'd managed to hold the water skin underneath him as they'd put the boots in. His face was bruised, but at least he hadn't lost any teeth. With a groan he began to walk and took the long way around, just in case he was still being watched. Eventually he made his way back to the place he'd buried his money and left his two minions. The skeletons stood stock still, as they had when he'd left them. Lot of good you two were, he grumbled at them. They watched him with that same steady fire in their eyes that they were born with as if judging him. I know, I know, he sighed. It was my decision. Could he have defended himself with his minions? Perhaps, perhaps not. If he revealed himself to be a necromancer he would have put the marshals back on his trail in an instant. If they'd still attacked him regardless, he might have been forced to kill in order to survive. Something he wasn't willing to do. He'd taken a chance and come up short. Ah, well... He winced, let's take it slow for a little while. He paused. I need to stop talking to the skeletons, he said. Progress slowed considerably from that point. He walked with a heavy limp due to a kick in the hip he'd received, not to mention the numerous aches and pains that flared up as he moved. Despite the pain, he did his best to focus his attention on the surrounding forest, wary of encountering any further riftkin. Each of the creatures he found was a danger and an opportunity. Unless he happened to stumble upon a recent gravisite, he wasn't likely to get his hands on any remains he could use to practice his signature magic. Which meant the only way he could gather the proficiency necessary to increase his level was to have his skeletons fight. He was sorely tempted to turn around and try to hunt down a few frontier farmers, but he tried hard to squash that grudge. It would be morally wrong, he knew that, but he also knew that he would more than likely get himself killed. If he went storming back there looking for trouble. He may have grandiose visions of walking at the head of his own undead army one day. But at present he was level 2. In the grand scheme of things. He remembered his father saying. Once you have a class and pump a few levels into it. Sometimes even before then. Depending on the class. You can basically kick the shit out of anyone who hasn't awakened. The abilities they grant are just that good. Maybe there's a few exceptional people out there who raised swordsmanship to a high level. By the time they reach 18 who can still defeat a level 1 swordsman. But those types are rare. Why don't I practice my skills then? A younger Tyron had asked Keen to extract the wisdom of his powerful father. While he was feeling talkative. Waste of time, Magnin shrugged. You learn skills related to your class about 10 times faster after you've awakened compared to a non-classer. That's the Unseen helping you out along your path. You could spend 4 years practicing the blade and reach level 5 in the skill. Or you could do that in 4 months once you got the class. Kids like you should just be having fun. He'd reached out and ruffled his child's hair at that point. As his son, Tyron had been painfully aware of how hard it was for his father to control his strength. They'd lost more than a little furniture over the years. Even so, he treasured these moments. But don't forget, a newly awakened classer is still a piece of garbage in the broader context. Tyron had glanced around quickly, 
Don't worry, Magnin grinned, your mother is shopping. Now, until you reach level 5, you don't even have a class feat, and your abilities are low level garbage. Once you reach level 20 and advance your class, then you'll start to have some real power under your sleeve. Until then, you're just small fry. That's why the Slayer Academy exists. Once you've awakened, you can go there and they'll help you through the early stages when you're too weak to do much. Or you can come out with mother and me. We'll show you the ropes. He smiled at the memory even as he tried to avoid aggravating his bruises. He had to keep in mind that he was still a piece of garbage, as the great warrior Magnin had phrased it. He also didn't have the ability to rely on his parents or enroll in an academy to help through this weak period. He had to push through the power trough on his own, which meant being a small target and not drawing attention to himself as much as possible. No matter how much he wanted payback on some fat-fisted farmers, Eventually he stumbled across a creek and stopped long enough to wash his wounds in the cold, murky water scrubbing out his hair while he was at it. Perhaps it didn't help his cleanliness all that much, but at the very least he was able to confirm he wasn't bleeding from anywhere under his clothing. For two further miserable days he traveled in this way. Sleeping was almost impossible, given his wounds and the lack of anything soft to lie on. He encountered several more rivkin, fending them off with the skeletons but he wasn't able to come out unscathed. Not that he himself was injured, but the skeletons began to accrue damage. Another gem biter, but larger than the first he'd seen, managed to crack the left leg of one of his minions. The skeleton was still able to walk, though slower. It was still enough to keep up with his own hobbled speed. Problems arose when he noticed that it took much more of his magic to keep it moving than before. If he wanted to keep the minion around, he would need to stop more frequently or be constantly using mage candy in order to sustain the necessary flow of energy. He was close to the keep now, or at least he should be. But if the beasts he encountered continued to grow stronger, he would need all the help he could get. With reluctance, he placed another of the magic-filled crystals under his tongue and drew on it to allow his wounded minion to continue to move. In a strange way he was attached to these two unthinking bone creatures. They were the first real steps he had taken on his journey as a necromancer, and he would always remember them even if he became much more proficient at raising his servants in the future. In fact, he needed to become more proficient. If he never raised anything more useful than these two, he would be in trouble. When he finally stumbled into the edge of the clearing in which the Slayer Keep was situated, he was a mess. A fever had seized him the day before, suggesting that he might have suffered some internal injury from his beating, and many of his bruises had yet to fade. His injured skeleton had been lost fighting another gem biter, though he'd been able to finish the creature off with his second skeleton, and recover the sword at least. He was forced to sacrifice his one remaining servant a few hours prior when a hulking rifkin had found him as he hobbled amongst the trees. As large as a bull, the beast had been a nightmare of gem-encrusted flesh, that he had instantly decided he could not defeat. Ordering his skeleton to engage the beast, he turned and run as best he could in the other direction, his heart pounding in his chest the whole time. Losing both of his minions was a painful blow, the magical connection that bonded them to him snapped as they died, taking a portion of his spent energy with them. It was strange. His servants felt no pain, nor fear, nor any emotion at all. They met their deaths the same as they met everything else with cold obedience to his will. His first two undead, lost just like that. First proper undead. Zombies don't count. Fortunately, the creature hadn't followed and he had arrived here shortly after. Far from relief, all he felt was a resigned acceptance of just how weak he really was now that he was out in the world. What should have been a short and easy journey, had turned into him being robbed and losing both of his minions to relatively weak creatures from the rifts. He squashed his rising bitterness and tried to focus his exhausted mind as he stumbled toward the keep. Woodsedge, he reminded himself, on the outskirts of the Orthorn Forest. Find some lodgings and try not to get robbed. Again. The trees had been cleared for over a hundred meters beyond the outer wall, and Tyron had to limp quite a distance around, before he met the road that led to the gate. There were only two ways in and out of Woodsedge, one that led back toward the province, and one that led straight toward the broken lands within the forest itself. Of the two, the gate he preferred to use was obvious. Due to the recent danger the road was mostly empty, and he was glad to join a very short line behind only a few wagons. 
seeking to gain entry, in order to sell their wares inside. When he finally stepped to the front of the line, he tried to fix a harmless smile on his face, as he approached the two guards on duty. The effect of his efforts did more to make him look deranged rather than cheerful. Corporal Norfran was shocked to see such a ragged looking kid out on the frontier, let alone one with such a frightening countenance. Holy shit, kid, he exclaimed, you look like death. Ran into Rift Kin out on the road, Tyron said. I, uh, didn't have the best time of it. That much is obvious, Norfran waved his partner to deal with the next cart in line. The inspections took time, and this one didn't look like he could hurt a newborn lamb. If you can't handle a few of the weaker beasts, then you really ought not to be traveling out here. I didn't think I'd see that many so far from the keep. He tried not to sound too accusatory as he spoke, but the guard picked up anyway. We've had an outbreak this week, it's true. I think some big shot slayers have been called in to squash it before anything too serious happens. Anyways, what's your business in Woodsedge? Visiting, Tyron tried to shrug, but a stab of pain rocked him halfway through the motion. Looking for work, he finished lamely. Corporal Northran looked him up and down. This kid couldn't be more than a month or two past his awakening, and already he'd fallen into such a state. Are you able to pay the gate fee? He asked dubiously. He was even more surprised when the lad unhesitatingly reached into what remained of his cloak and pulled out a silver sovereign. My parents paid for my trip. The kid tried to smile but failed. But I don't have much left. Is there a healer I can see inside? There were many in fact. Curing the wounded was a major industry around any slayer keep. Alright then. You've paid the fee. Let me take your details. And then you can go get yourself looked after, Northran sighed. It wasn't his business to question the decision of every glory seeker who ran to the broken lands the day after they awakened. It was his job to take their money and their names and get on to the next one. What's your name? He asked readying his ink and clipboard. Ah. For a moment Tyron obviously blanked as he forgot the fake identity he had prepared for himself. He blinked and tried to force his sluggish brain to move. Lucas Armsfield. Uh-huh. I'll put you down as seeking employment, Lucas. If you need a healer but don't have much coin then I suggest you head to Iron Square. Most of the cheaper places are there. T thanks Tyron stammered before he stepped past the guard and through the open gate. Behind him Corporal Northran shook his head as he watched the kid walk inside Woodsedge. This time of year, kids like him wear a dime a dozen. In two months, most of them would be dead or will have seen sense and run home. For those who dreamed of being a slayer but couldn't pay for entry for a college, running away to a keep was the only path left for them to pursue their dreams. Poor parents. He sighed to himself as he turned back and waved the next in line forward. A huge weight rolled off Tyron's shoulders the moment he was out of sight of the gate. His biggest fear was that he wouldn't make it here before word spread of his flight. If that happened then the odds of the guards demanding a verified status before allowing him entry would skyrocket. As it was he was just another kid on the road who didn't belong there. Exhausted and feeling increasingly delirious. He did his best not to draw attention, as he tried to navigate the haphazard town outside of the keep. He'd heard a long time ago from his mother, that almost every keep, even the most inhospitable ones, were host to some sort of settlement. Slayers had money to burn, but nowhere to go, which meant that merchants and services had to come to them if they wanted to gouge the profits. With merchants came mercenaries, shopkeepers, inns, brothels and all the other machinery of society. After he finally asked for directions he was pointed in the direction he needed. The Iron Square, so named since only the Iron Ranked Slayers would go there, unable to afford anything better. After being bandaged and fed some foul-smelling concoction by the apothecary to deal with his internal bleeding, Tryon was shoved back out onto the street feeling overcharged and even more exhausted. He resorted to pinching and poking himself in his wounded leg to stay awake as he made his way through the narrow streets. He was on the verge of collapse before he finally found an inn he was satisfied with. After arranging for lodging for the night and forcing himself to eat a few slices of bread with stew, he staggered upstairs, found his room and collapsed into the bed asleep before he hit the mattress. He woke a few times over the next 12 hours, the first time because the pommel of his sword was digging into his hip. So he drowsily undressed before climbing into the bed proper, the second because he was dehydrated, and in desperate need of a piss. Eventually his eyes dragged open and he spluttered back to wakefulness. Aches and pains riddled his body. He felt nauseous and hungry at the same time, 
and his mind was still sluggish from lack of sleep. But he felt he wasn't going to improve if he stayed in bed beyond this point. He looked around the cramped room he found himself in, with one window, a small cupboard and vanity, a single chair with a tiny table inside. This was as good as things were going to get for the foreseeable future. For someone who spent many nights sleeping in an attic, he thought this wouldn't bother him. But back then, he'd always had the option of going back to his house if he so chose. Now, he was stuck with this, and for that reason it grated on him. Get over it, Tyron, he scolded himself. He had more important things to worry about than the state of his lodgings. His pack remained on the floor where he dumped it, which was lucky since, to his chagrin, he'd not bolted the door after walking in last night. Cursing himself for a fool, he quickly checked his belongings and sagged with relief when he found nothing missing. If there was one thing he could be grateful for, it's that Woodsedge was well policed. It had to be if they wanted to keep the Slayers in line. As he stood with a sigh, Tyron reflected on his last week. It had cost him a good chunk of his coin, both of his minions and a massive knock to his ego. But this first, smallest part of his journey had finished. From here, it was only going to get harder. He had to grow his skills and abilities without allowing anyone to learn of them. And he had to do it right under the noses of the authorities. Still, out here he had access to the two things he needed most. Rivkin to fight and bodies. He was going to need a lot of bodies. Chapter 17. The rest of the day was taken up with eating, drinking and sleeping, as Tyron recovered from his journey. He kept to himself and focused on getting his energy and focus back as quickly as possible. His overuse of mage candy had stretched his tolerance quite a bit and he would need time to detoxify his system. Frankly, he was embarrassed at how badly the journey had played out. He'd taken far longer to arrive here than he should have and lost so much along the way. Without the little forethought that he'd managed to summon, he could have lost everything and arrived at Woodsedge a stumbling pauper. No point crying over spilt milk, he scolded himself. Learn from it and get better. And he would. The first thing he did was to take steps that he didn't draw any notice to himself. He took his meals in his room and kept to himself as he committed to his convalescence. He refused to take any action until he was back to full fitness. Not in his body, but in his mind. The fatigue and stress he'd endured had left him listless and vague. Not something he could afford to be. So he leaned on his dwindling supply of coin to buy himself two full days to recover. So he slept, and ate, and thought, and then slept some more until he rose the following morning. His muscles still contained an echo of the pain and stiffness he'd endured. But his mind felt fresh and clear once more. Here we go, he muttered to himself. All of the sudden the nervous energy and desire to advance that he had bottled up came gushing forward, and it was difficult to pull his boots on due to his hands shaking. He couldn't afford to waste any more time. There was almost zero chance that word of a fugitive hadn't spread, one with a forbidden class, and possibly with a sizable bounty to boot. He wasn't a petty thief or smuggler either, those sorts of bounty notices were a dime a dozen. For a necromancer it was likely that the Baron would pull out a much more significant purse. Thankfully the keep had seen a constant influx of young people over the week, according to the gossip he'd had from the kitchen maids. Which meant he was just one face among hundreds. That also meant competition would be heating up, and he couldn't afford to wait any longer. He moved at a quick walk that morphed into a slow jog, once he was out onto the street in the early morning light. Luckily he was able to find what he needed without too much trouble, though he had to part with a gold sovereign for it. With his prize tucked under his arm, he rushed back to the inn he boarded at, grabbing a plate of breakfast which he took to his room. As soon as the door was shut behind him he sat in the center of the room, put the plate down to his side, and carefully ripped a page from his freshly acquired book. Given how important a supply of blank paper was to literally everyone, he hadn't realized just how expensive it would be to buy. Even allowing for inflated prices due to being out on the frontier, he'd been shocked at the amount the store clerk had demanded. It was possible he was getting fleeced, but no matter how he'd tried the man hadn't budged on his price, so he'd just given in and paid. He'd never had to buy a book or paper before, since his parents kept a healthy stock of it in the house, so he had no idea how much the small, leather-bound bundle of clean white sheets under his arm would cost back in Foxbridge. Still, he couldn't bring himself to care at this moment. He'd been waiting so long for this. A small prick on his finger using the tip of his knife, and then he was ready to perform the status ritual. Events? 
Your attempts at stealth have increased proficiency. Sneak has reached level 2. Your use of swordsmanship has increased proficiency. Concentration has increased proficiency. Concentration has reached level 3. Your minions have battled on your behalf. Your minions have fallen in your service. Necromancer has reached level 4. You have received plus 4 intelligence, plus 2 wisdom and plus 2 willpower. New choices available. The darkness continues to be pleased with your progress. They urge you to continue on your path. The abyss grows impatient. Name. Tyron Steelhand. Age. 18. Race. Human. Level 10. Class. Necromancer. Level 4. Subclasses. Anathema. Level 3. None. None. Racial feats. Level 5. Steady Hand. Level 10. Night Owl. Attributes. Strength. 12. Dexterity. 11. Constitution. 20. Intelligence. 26. Wisdom. 18. Willpower. 24. Charisma. 13. The origin of this chapter's debut can be traced to N0 V3 liters B1N. Manipulation. 11. Poise. 13. General skills. Arithmetic. Level 5. Handwriting. Level 4. Concentration. Level 3. Cooking. Level 1. Sling. Level 3. Swordsmanship, level 1. Sneak, level 2. Skill selections available. 2. Necromancer skills. Corpse appraisal, level 1. Corpse preparation, level 1. General spells. Globe of light, level 8. Sleep, level 4. Mana bolt, level 1. Necromancer spells. Raise dead, level 3. Bone stitching, level 2. Mysteries. Spell shaping. Int, plus 3. Wiss, plus 3. Necromancer level 4. Please choose an additional spell. Flesh mending repair dead flesh. Please choose an additional skill. Empower servant feed mana to your minions. Death magic attuned to death. Two levels at once. Tyron sucked in his breath at this. Reaching level 5 would have been incredible, since it would grant him his first class feat. But he couldn't be disappointed with this. Level 4 was enough for him to get his next skill or spell, and it would be an important choice given his circumstances. He was disappointed to see that Anathema hadn't leveled and the message received about the Abyss sounded ominous to say the least. He had no idea who or what the Abyss referred to, and he certainly hadn't become more enthused about the idea of contacting them via some ritual. But he felt a tinge of fear at the thought of having something so powerful. It could grant him a subclass angry at him. Pushing that aside, his lack of growth as a human was also grating. Level 10 at his age was definitely on the low side. Usually people gained roughly a level a year. Being as isolated and antisocial as he was had cost him in this regard. It hadn't really bothered him in the past, but now he felt a need to progress in his racial levels keenly. He needed access to more general skills, which he gained every second level, and more importantly, he needed the human racial bonus that would open for him at level 20. That extra class slot would be so important down the line, especially since he'd lost a slot to Anathema through no fault of his own. The subclass gave him fantastic stats per level, that was true, but he had no idea how useful it would be, or how legal it was. He suspected it might even be more hated than Necromancer. Thank goodness there was no way for anyone to know he had it outside of a full appraisal. Something he had to avoid like the plague. Before he did anything else, he carefully wrote down on the page a few words using his own blood. New general skill. Butchery. His face twisted a little as he wrote, but he didn't hesitate to do it. This was necessary for the next step, and as much as he didn't want to admit, the skill would likely come in handy for his class as well. He carefully tried to avoid thinking about that as he brought his eyes to the bottom of the page. As expected, he was still able to select Flesh Mending, the choice he'd ignored at level 2. He felt no urge to take it this time around either. He'd moved on from zombies to another form of undead, and he didn't see a reason to go back. His new options were skills rather than spells, and he read each of them carefully. Empower Servant felt intuitive to him. When he raised a minion a large part of the process involved forging a conduit between him and it, a connection that allowed the minion to draw on his magic to fuel its actions. The energy that allowed a skeleton to move had to come from somewhere. It certainly wasn't burning body fat. This skill would teach him how to push magic through the connection manually, granting the minion additional speed and strength. It would definitely be useful, 
but he had to consider the cost. He suspected that for the early levels at least, the skill would be horrendously inefficient, which was a major problem, since he struggled to support even two minions at present. The additional stats he gained from leveling Necromancer would certainly help, but he was hesitant to take a skill that he may not be able to use at present. Likewise, the next choice had similar drawbacks. This kind of skill wasn't uncommon, although this particular one might well be. He knew for a fact his mother had several such skills, namely fire magic and earth magic, that allowed her to cast those spells with great ease. These skills could also act as a prerequisite for spells, feats or even classes. It wouldn't do much for him right now, other than helping him cast Ray's dead a little easier, but the potential benefits were large. Tyron was a little nonplussed that both new offerings weren't very useful for him in his present circumstances. But then, not much could have been. Both were potentially very useful, and he could see himself coming back to take either one in the future. He considered his choice carefully, as he stared down at the blood letters for several long minutes, before he marked his desired choice with a drop. Death magic it would be. He was sure it was illegal, but what did that matter to him? His status page was already outlawed possibly several times over. He couldn't be positive, since he still had no idea how the Necromancer class would proceed, and what spells and skills he would be offered. But he felt that it was a safe bet he would seeing enough choices related to death magic, that he would get more than enough value out of the skill. The knowledge that it could act as a prerequisite for many things helped seal the deal. With his selections made, he ended the ritual and immediately swooned as the change came upon him. He didn't fall unconscious, but it took him over an hour before he felt comfortable pushing himself off the floor. By now his breakfast had become cold, but he forced himself to eat it anyway. He'd need the energy, and couldn't afford to skip meals that he was paying for anyway. That was another consideration, should he move somewhere cheaper. He currently had no source of income, and this place was probably in the mid-range of inns in Woodsedge. If was to live within his means, he'd need to find somewhere much cheaper. But part of him hesitated. For now, he decided to stay. The food was good, and the security was excellent. If he moved to a cheaper place to save money and was robbed, that would set him considerably more than paying double for a room. If he was careful with his remaining coin, he'd be able to stay here for a long time yet, months if need be. If he was able to start earning some sovereigns, then that time could stretch out to a year or more. And that was his next concern. Having rested and completed the ritual, he needed to move on to the next step. He gathered his plate and stood, squaring his shoulders before he marched down the stairs and into the common room, making sure to lock his door behind him. This next part was going to be unpleasant. But it was a necessary step if he was going to succeed. Tyron avoided being pulled into conversation by the serving maids, each of them giggling as he walked past, and trying to extract gossip out of him, and walked purposefully out into the town. It took a little while for him to find what he was looking for, and a little while longer to work himself up to the point of actually stepping in the door. When he did, the first thing he noticed was the smell, it was overpowering. Blood, and a lot of it. The second thing that drew his notice was the temperature. It was noticeably colder inside than it had been outside. Is that why the door was so heavy? He turned to stare at the thick paneled wood for a moment before he curiously glanced around the shop. It had to be enchantments keeping the temperature down this much, nothing else could do it. He couldn't spot where they were, but he'd be keen to take a look if he got the chance. He knew a couple of runes, picked them up offhand by poking at his parents' enchanted stuff, and he wouldn't mind. You gonna stare or are you gonna buy something? A gruff voice rumbled out. Tyron jumped and turned to see a squat man with the thickest forearms he'd ever seen folded across his chest. Even then it was easy to see the red stains that covered his fingers. Ah, hello. Tyron tried to smile but failed utterly. He was so useless in social situations. I was uh hoping to talk to you as a matter of fact. Spit it out lad, I don't have the time. Right, I'm wondering if you'll allow me to volunteer. Here, do some work. For free. Even he had to wince at how his voice trailed off under the steady glare of this rough looking man. The fellow looked him up and down, and then sighed minutely to himself. You kids running off here and looking to get yourself killed. Every damn year. You think I won your help just cause you smart enough to come here first. Tyron stood a little straighter. I took the butchery skill sir. The butcher's eyes narrowed a little at that, and his demeanor thawed oh so slightly. 
At least you got far much commitment. He paused and considered for a moment. You willing to work for free? Yes, sir. Don't call me sir. I work for a living. After a hard glare he rolled back on his heels. Tell you what. I want a month, eight hours a day. No less. Do that and I'll teach you something along the way. Deal. Tyron winced. A month was longer than he'd wanted to commit for. But he could see how it wouldn't be worth teaching him anything if he was gone after a week. It wasn't all bad though. If he worked here long enough it would help normalize his presence in Woodsedge. Help him build a routine and connect with the locals. He firmed his resolve. Deal. Right. Get in Thar back. Without another word the burly man turned and walked through the open door behind him from which the potent stench was wafting, leaving Tyron standing on his own in the entrance. After a dazed second he scrambled to move around the counter and through the door. Inside he found the temperature even colder and the stench even stronger. Seemingly immune to both. The butcher strode up to a long bench covered in treated wood from which he pulled the largest cleaver the young man had ever seen with one hand from where it had been wedged. Got a delivery over elk packed in crates. Crack them out and haul them in one by one. This time Tyron did as instructed without pause, and so followed the longest day of physical labor he had ever done in his life. The butcher drove him as hard as a slave driver, as if to make sure he extracted every ounce of value from the free help that he could. So Tyron opened crates, hauled corpses, ran deliveries, sharpened knives, so many knives. All the while the stout man executed the methods of his trade with inhuman precision. Beneath his hands whole carcasses were skinned and sectioned with ease that belied the absurd level of strength and skill he possessed. By the time dusk rolled around, the young necromancer was thoroughly exhausted, his forearms and back burning from the unfamiliar work. What galled him the most was not once during the entire day, did he perform a single activity. That might see him increase the level of butchery. As he leaned against the wall to recover the butcher was packing up with the same efficiency he had done the rest of his work. After the last of his tools had been cleaned to a mirror shine, he turned and spoke. My name's Hack, short fur Hacketh. I'll see ye early morn tomorrow. Sure thing, Mr. Hacketh, Tyron forced out. The grizzled man snorted at his words and jerked his head to the door. Not needing an invitation, Tyron practically ran out the door before he turned to give a brief wave to his employer, and then made his way back to his residence. A full meal, taken in the common room this time, was a welcome distraction for him after the day's events and he found himself eating with far more appetite than was usual for him. A lot of farmer's boys in Foxbridge had mocked him over the years for being a soft prince with a silver spoon in his mouth, and he'd always hated that description, but in this moment he couldn't really fault them. He'd worked hard before, sure, extremely hard on occasion, but generally he was used to doing most of his heavy lifting with his mind. Something most of those farmers, with a few notable exceptions, were totally inept at. Which he had reminded them of, frequently. Though his muscles already protested and gave warning hints of the aches to come in the morning, Tyron knew his day wasn't done. With a sigh he pushed his chair back and headed back out into the fading light. Finding a spot for this next task would be a touch tricky. Chapter 18 the next morning Hack rose with the dawn, as was his habit, and carefully rolled out of bed, so as not to disturb his still slumbering wife. The woman had a fierce temper when she didn't get enough sleep, and he was wise enough to know her little care on his part, would pay dividends down the line. In the near darkness he fumbled until he was able to light a single candle, by which he was able to dress himself and make his way downstairs. After a simple breakfast that he prepared himself, that cooking skill really came in handy at times. He walked out the door and into the brisk morning air. When he finally arrived at his shop, he was more than a little surprised by what he saw. Good morning Mr. Hack. The young man greeted him a little awkwardly. The butcher shook his head slightly as he walked towards the door and drew a heavy iron key out of his pocket. Yeah, don't need to call me mister, he grumbled. Feels unnatural. The lad shrugged to indicate his lack of feeling on the matter and silently followed the older man inside. Was sure I be seeing ye face today, he said. I figure a lot of people don't come back after a first day like that, Tyron replied. True enough. I had a think about it, and to tell the truth I suspect that might even be the point. Hack grunted and continued arranging his knives for the day. I feel as if there might be several days of grueling menial work in my future, before I get to practice butchering. 
There was no judgment in the young man's voice, just a simple statement of his thoughts. As the butcher eyed him sideways, Tyron waited patiently for instructions. Finally, Hack broke his silence. M daughter will be here today. She helps with the store. The combination of tone and glare from the burly man delivered a secondary message loud and clear. Keep your filthy hands off my daughter. What do you need me to do? Tyron asked. Your message has been received loud and clear, his demeanor replied. Hackath grunted and frowned. This kid is too quick on the uptake to be doing what he's doing. He thought, still, it's not my place to care about that. Pushing that aside, he gave the first instructions of the day to the kid, and almost felt irritated at how readily the lad leapt to obey. How many times had he seen kids in the same position break down before the first day was even done? let alone show this level of enthusiasm on day two. Certainly none that had actually realized they wouldn't learn shit until Hack was good and ready to teach it. For his part, Tyron kept his head down, ignored his protesting muscles and got to work. He understood the position he was in perfectly. He'd follow through on the agreement he'd made as best he could, which meant working his ass off for the surly butcher. And he could only hope that Hacketh would do the same. It certainly wasn't ideal. But he was the powerless one hoping to leech some levels from the tradesmen, so the terms were to be expected. Two hours later the bell over the door rang out, and Tyron put down the knife he was sharpening to poke his head through the door, to see who had entered the front of the shop. He was quite surprised to see a gorgeous young woman with bright blonde curls and clear blue eyes, closing the door behind her as she stepped into the store. Since he'd been instructed to watch the door he stepped out to inquire. Excuse me miss, how can I help you? He asked quickly wiping his hands on the cloth he kept tucked into his belt. Keeping your hands as clean as possible was the first rule he'd learned from the butcher. One that the stone-faced tradesman enforced with fanatical intensity. Hearing his voice the girl turned and gifted him a dazzling smile. Oh, hello, I'm here to work. Are you a new apprentice? I'm Madeline. She stepped forward and extended her hand for him to shake. Tyron stared blankly for a moment before something in his brain clicked. You're Mr. Hacker's daughter. He smiled stiffly, scarcely believing his own words. Mr. Hacker. She giggled. He must hate that. Her hand was still extended between them and Tyron's eyes flicked down to it as if it were a deadly viper. Before he glanced back up to her far too pretty face. He was supposed to believe that she was related to Hack. Some things simply weren't genetically possible. Too smart to shake hands with my daughter are you? A deep voice rumbled from just over his shoulder. Moving a little unsteadily Tyron lifted his hand and gently grasped the dainty hand extended before him for a brief second. Before he released it, stepped around the imposing butcher behind him and made his way back to the low seat with the sharpening stone embedded in it. Madeline giggled again at the wooden display and looked up at her father, who smiled and winked. Customers here soon, lovely. Make sure you're ready. She rolled her eyes and shooed her father back through the door. Did he really think she needed to be told that? Soon after Tyron managed to recover his senses he heard the bell sing out again, as the first of what would become a steady flow of customers entered the store to engage with Madeline, who would display both charm and canny business sense as she closed deal after deal for her father. Quite impressive for a young woman who, if he didn't miss his guess, was a year younger than him, and therefore hadn't awakened yet. Not that it was any of his business. In fact, he had little time to think about the butcher's shockingly attractive daughter, since the man was even more determined to work him to the bone than he had been the day before. Is this because I shook her hand? He couldn't help but wonder as his arms and legs shook from exertion as he unstacked another wagon of meat. The sheer volume of animals that passed through this one butchery was almost enough to make his head hurt. Was every day like this. But when he thought back to something his mother told him, it made a kind of sense. Slayers are simple creatures, most of them. That is, she said with some level of distaste, which shocked him considering both she herself and the man she married were slayers. Most of them she emphasized with a smile when she saw the look on his face. There are exceptions to every rule. And it just so happened that two such people managed to find each other. The rest of them. She waved a dismissive hand, not worth the time. Like animals, all they want to do is fight, feast and fuck. If you actually want to progress in the profession, it's best to avoid most of the people in it. 
Tyron had picked up enough tidbits of information around town to know that there were roughly a thousand slayers in the keep right now, with another thousand out in the field at any given time. The entire economy of Woodsedge revolved around those thousand people, which was why half the town consisted of healers, weaponsmiths and armorers, and the other half taverns, inns and brothels. Hacketh was not the only local butcher, and it was likely no exaggeration to say that every one of them did the same level of business that he did. By the end of the day Tyron was even more exhausted than he'd been the previous one, but he grit his teeth and farewelled the gruff man at the door, before he turned and staggered back to his inn. Some food and water helped him recover, and then he went up to his room to collect his notes, and back out into the town. He didn't have much time left. The next two days passed as a blur to the harried young man. Sleep was hard to come by, and he leaned heavily into his constitution and night owl feet to push through. Every morning he would be standing by the door as Hacketh arrived to work, and he would leave a shaking wreck at the end of the day. He did his best to ignore Madeline's attempts to draw him into conversation whilst not being impolite. He got the feeling she just wanted to tease him and annoy her father a little but Tyron was perfectly aware that he would be the one to suffer if he engaged. At night he continued to work on his project, writing copious notes, and doing his best to unravel the magic, until finally he felt that he might be ready. His last status had been a stark warning, one that he wouldn't ignore. He had no idea who or what the abyss might refer to, but anything powerful enough to voice its displeasure through his status ritual was not something he wanted getting too ticked off at him. He felt strongly enough about it that he had decided to take some risks in order to do something about it. His legs throbbed with pain as he crouched low, keeping a close eye on the patrols. Luckily these weren't official marshals, just private mercenaries hired by the merchant's office. But getting caught would still land him a painful spot. He waited for the right timing, when the guards stepped around the corner of the far warehouse, and then he stole forward a few meters, listening intently. When the footsteps had faded enough he checked behind himself again, making sure the other patrol hadn't deviated from their usual pattern. When he saw nothing he steadied himself with a deep breath before he rose slightly and broke into a light run, still bent at the waist to reduce his profile. He weaved his way through pallets of goods and crates containing goodness knows what probably more meat for him to unpack tomorrow, before he reached his goal, and knelt down, as he leaned against the wood panels, to catch his breath and massage the cramps out of his legs. He could see the glow from the lamp carried by the second guard now, growing stronger as he approached the place Tyron had been hidden only a minute before. He quieted his breathing as he waited long seconds before the second guard arrived back on this side of the warehouse. As they drew closer the two men paused, the light of their lamps melding together as a low conversation broke out between them and Tyron rolled his eyes. Stop gossiping and get back to work, idiots. I can't wait here all night. Only 30 meters separated him from their position, and he wasn't prepared to move a muscle while the two of them were still there. So he waited until 10 minutes later, when the two finally decided to continue their routes. The moment the two were out of sight he rose and made his way around the other side of the building, where he found the window he'd worked on during his previous visit. He carefully checked it and found it still open, so he pulled it wider, before hopping up onto a box he'd positioned, and carefully wiggled his way through the gap. It'd be nice if there was a wider opening he could use, but part of what made this space perfect for his purposes, was the very few places light could leak out which meant small windows were a definite plus. As he continued squeezing himself through he put his hands down and found the hard wooden surface he was looking for, supporting himself with his hands as he pulled his legs through. Good thing he was still fairly slender, he doubted someone with more meat on them like Rufus would be able to fit it all. The thought of his old friend caused a sour expression to wash over his face, but he pushed the emotion away, he had no time for it right now. Gathering his bearings in the dark, he fumbled about until he found the blanket and pinned it over the window, being sure to pull it closed first. Only when this was done did he create a soft globe of light and look about. He'd been lucky to stumble on this place during his first night of explorations. With the frankly huge amount of goods moving in and out of Woodsedge, it only made sense that there was a sizable depot for the merchants to receive and send off merchandise. This collection of warehouses and storage was exactly what he needed, and when he found this particular building, basically a shed for storing wagons or carts, unused and covered in a fine layer of dust, 
he'd decided it suited his purposes. He moved with caution, conscious to try and keep any noise to a minimum, as he placed three more soft lights around the space, to give him the illumination he needed to continue his work from the previous night. He tiredly rubbed at his eyes before he clapped himself on both cheeks, and looked down at the dust on the floor, or more accurately, the mostly completed spell circle he'd drawn. When he'd reached Anathema level 2 he'd been given the choice of three spells, Dark Communion, Appeal to the Court or Pierce the Veil, and he'd chosen the latter. Just like with Ray's Dead, the selection granted him a measure of knowledge, placed in his head by the universe itself, that would allow him to cast the spell. However, just like with Ray's Dead, the knowledge he was given did not also grant understanding or come close to the full extent of what could be known about the magic. He was given the basics, an introduction, and it was up to him to learn and develop the rest, which he tried to do. Pulling out his notebook, he flicked through several pages of notes where he tried to break down the fundamental principles of this spell. He summoned another globe of light just above his head to better allow him to see the pages, as he frowned down at his own work. It wasn't enough, not even close. This magic was complex, almost as difficult as the raised dead spell itself, and that was the most intricate spellwork he'd ever come into contact with. There were elements to pierce the veil that he had simply never seen before, some that were a little familiar, and others that were utterly bizarre, breaking his own understanding of how these things should work. Tyron was honest enough to admit to himself that he was quite talented when it came to magic, especially on the theory side. But even he wasn't confident of a successful cast. Under better circumstances he would spend weeks practicing the separate parts of the spell, unpacking the theory, and examining the spell forms, until he had mastered as much as he could without performing the magic. But he didn't have the time. With a long, slow breath he focused himself, consulted his notes once more, and then got back to work on the circle on the ground. The pattern needed to be as precise as he could make it each line a channel for arcane energy. That would help fuel the spell, and hopefully guide it to its successful conclusion. He tried to work without making sound as he paced back and forth, adding a stroke here, correcting a curve there, comparing his notes to the collection of half-memories in his head. As far as he could tell, the circle itself acted as a kind of anchor, a steadying barrier that locked itself and everything inside it within a point of space and time. The rest of the spell was far more esoteric and involved a reaching out, and as suggested by the name a piercing. But what exactly he would be poking through, he had no idea. Nor what he would find on the other side. He could only assume that the entities that had granted him the anathema class, did so to help rather than hurt him. From the messages he'd seen so far, he got the feeling that was the case, but he couldn't be certain. One more time he walked around the circle, bringing the light lower to inspect his work once more, before he sighed and snapped shut his book. It was as good as he could make it under the circumstances. There wasn't much point delaying any longer. He placed the book down on the side bench with care, and then withdrew two items from his inner pocket. The first, a water skin which he took a long draw from, careful to wet his throat, this would be a long cast and he wanted to ensure he didn't lose the power of speech at the end. Likewise the second item was to protect him from running out of resources, Mage Candy. He took another deep breath, centered himself before he stepped with great care into the center of the circle, ensuring he didn't scuff any lines. With that done, he extinguished each globe in the room, returning his surroundings to total darkness. Then he began to speak. Chapter 19. Words of power rolled sonorously from his mouth as he concentrated on each syllable, ensuring that no errors were made. At the same time he split his focus, directing a portion of his attention to the circle beneath his feet, into which he began to direct a steady flow of magic. The power built over time as he continued to speak, the sweat already beginning to bead on his brow, and he tried to remain hushed without breaking the flow, and enunciating correctly. Remember Tyron, his mother told him, a misspoken word can be as good as a death sentence, with high level spells. Diction, saves, lives. As good as the advice was, he pushed the memory away, he had to focus. Beneath his feet a dark purple flame began to flicker around the soles of his feet, causing shadows to dance along the floor and walls, dimly at first, but with growing intensity, as the flame spread through the channels he had created with such painstaking effort. As he continued to intone the spell the fire grew, directed by the circle he had drawn. The ethereal tons of flame spread through the pattern with deliberate slowness, as he controlled the trickle of energy. 
Sweat had already begun to drip from his face as he maintained his dual focus, speaking the words and empowering the circle at the same time. He knew he had to control the pace of the spell with great care. If he advanced too quickly without the proper activation of the circle, the spell would fail, with disastrous consequences. But if he ignited it too early, he wouldn't be able to maintain the drain of magic, causing it to fail when he needed it most. Already the drain on his reserves was beyond the point he would have been able to sustain, before he'd received his class. Without the precious levels he gained, this spell would have been impossible for him to cast. In fact, if he only had access to the Necromancer class and not the bonus stats from his two levels in Anathema, he'd have no hope either. Moving with tremendous care, he brought the arcane crystal in his hand up to his mouth, as he continued to speak, waiting for a pause between syllables to slide it under his tongue. For one horrible moment the crystal shifted in his mouth and his tongue twisted to prevent it from sliding loose. He managed to settle it just in time as he sucked in a quick breath and continued only the slightest hitch detectable in his otherwise steady voice. Even so he rubbed his palms across his shirt to try and prevent them from shaking. That had been close to a disaster. For the next minute he concentrated only on speaking and drawing deeper, steadying breaths in the breaks, and only once he felt he had calmed down. When the pounding of his heart in his chest had settled, did he once more begin to channel power into the circle. To an outside observer the scene would have been equal parts beautiful and disturbing, as the young man stood rock still, lit from below by purple fire. That oh so slowly drew an intricate pattern of loops and walls on the floor that turned, connected and broke, in a never-ending dance. That entwined itself in a neat circle, that spread in a two-meter radius from his feet. Perhaps more disturbing than that was the vague darkness that had begun to form, wavering in the air directly in front of the youth. It was so thin, and blended with the shadows so well. One could be forgiven for thinking it was nothing more than a trick of the light. But how then to explain the strange sense of foreboding? That began to permeate the room. Tyron felt it. How could he not? He was the one actively summoning it. He wouldn't be distracted. He closed his eyes and spread his hands wide, as the words continued to roll from his mouth, giving form and shape to the magic that flowed from him in a steady stream. Wary that the trickle of energy he drew from the candy was no longer enough, he split his focus once again to draw on the crystal more actively compensating for the resources he was losing to power the spell. The origin of this chapter's debut can be traced to N0 V3 liters B1N. His calves burned, his shoulders ached, a headache pounded in his temples and his throat burned. But Tyron refused to bend as he continued to direct the flow of power, forcing it to bend to his will. Before he had received his class, such a feat would have been beyond him, but now he could barely manage. He waged a constant battle as the minutes ticked by, each element he sought to control growing more unruly, more difficult to contain, as more power fed into them. Why the hell wasn't I given any nice cantrips to cast from these damn classes? The thought flickered on the outskirts of his awareness, and he paid at no mind as he directed the spell. By now the flame had permeated all through the circle he had drawn. The pattern complete as the fire danced around his boots. With the protection complete, he was free to move into the final phase of the spell which he did without hesitation. He couldn't afford to waste time, even now the reserves of magic within him were falling low, despite the inflow from the candy under his tongue. His eyes still shut, he spoke the words, each one ringing in the air, infused with power as they added to the shape that continued to form in the air. After another five minutes through which Tyron mastered himself time and time again, the vague and indistinct shape had become more clear. A wafting curtain of pure darkness hung in the air, rippling as if brushed by a wind that none could feel. It wasn't large, barely a meter wide circle, but from that unnatural cloth came an aura that soaked the room in dread. Still Tyron continued to speak, his hands drawing closer to his chest as he focused, crafting the final aspect of the spell as he fought to maintain the disparate elements he had created. Sweat flowed freely down his face, dripping into his eyes and mouth, another hurdle that he had to adjust for, in order to pronounce each word with perfect clarity, not daring to shift his posture at this key moment. Slowly, slowly, the final piece began to form as he raised both hands into the air in front of him, reaching out toward the drifting curtain before him without touching it. Then, slowly, slowly, he drew his hands down again, lowering them from the level of his eyes down to his waist, and this time the spell responded to his action. As his hands fell, the cloth parted. As the final words rolled from his lips the darkness solidified, pierced the veil, 
It was done. Rung out, Tyron drew a ragged breath as he tried to still the trembling in his limbs. But he did not shift from his position, nor did he allow the flow of magic to the circle beneath his feet to falter. For a long second nothing happened until Tyron slowly opened his eyes to glimpse into something that should not be seen. In an instant his mind was assaulted as a voice forced its way into his head, babbling incoherently in a language he could not recognize. He rocked back on his heels, both hands flying to his head as the pain intensified a hundredfold. Unknown to him, blood had begun to flow from his nose and ears as the voice scratched and clawed within his skull. A Alokrak Alatha. Shelp Grinuak Kalkrig Oleath Al Oranik. An endless scream of one voice that quickly became a chorus, each pushing, stretching inside his head until tiring could contain it no longer and a long groan leaked out his mouth as he fought the presences in his head. On and on they babbled as he felt as if his headache might split his forehead open right in the middle, but he did not move from his spot anchored to the center of the circle, and he did not cut off the flow of power, which saved his life. As he continued to fight for his sanity, the dread aura within the room only intensified, the shadows deepening to a perfect darkness that suppressed the light of the flames, until they barely seemed to illuminate anything at all. Tendrils of otherness stretched through the opening, hesitant at first, then with growing confidence, as they met no resistance on the other side. What started as one quickly became a dozen, then a hundred, then an uncountable number, as they writhed through the air like roots seeking water. As if sensing the life within the young man, they honed in toward him, drawing ever closer as he continued to battle the voices. With a shout tyrant threw his hands down, palms facing the floor before he bit down on the crystal, shattering it in his mouth, and cutting the underside of his tongue. He grasped hold of the last flow of power from the gem, and flung it down to the flames through his hands, which he then clenched into fists. At this motion the fire roared, climbing up until it licked against the wooden ceiling without burning it. This wasn't a fire designed to consume the mundane. The building was in no danger from it. The tendrils on the other hand reacted immediately, pulling back from the fire as a frustrated shriek vibrated through the veil and rattled against Tyron's consciousness. As the purple flame roared, the necromancer once again found his mind clear. The voices forced out for a few seconds, and he acted decisively. He squeezed out the last ounce of power within himself as words once again echoed from his torn throat. With a deliberate motion he brought his hands wide before he forcefully brought them together in front of his face. He felt resistance, but he didn't allow it as with a large surge of mental energy he forced the veil to close. Then it was all gone. The fire, the veil, the strange presence and voices, all of it, vanished. Tyron stood, swaying on his feet as he continued to leak blood down over his mouth and from his ears, utterly exhausted. It would be so easy to collapse right here. So easy. Part of him yearned for it even, for the hard times to be over. But that wasn't his path, and he had turned away from it before. He almost sobbed as he forced himself to move. First one step, then the next, until he reached the bench, he gathered his book before he stumbled back and did what he could to drag his foot through the circle he had drawn, obliterating the lines. With the last of his energy he climbed onto the bench, uncovered the window and pushed himself out, almost uncaring when he flopped hard onto the ground on the other side. He lay there for a few minutes to collect his breath, and had to pinch himself to delay the onset of sleep. When he was ready he gathered himself and began to make his slow way back to the inn. With any luck he'd get some sleep before he had to be at the butchery the next day. Within the Slayer Keep, what the blazing fuck? Rogel sat up instantly in bed and reached for his blade, crashing through the door into the lounge of his team's group suite a few seconds later. Only the low-light vision feat prevented him from slamming his shin into the low table in the center of the room, as he cast his eyes about, seeking out the danger. Dove. He barked, talk to me. Fucking fuck. The voice echoed from the Mage's room and Rogel leapt to the door and ripped it open, tearing it off its hinges in the process. Inside he found the bearded man staring directly into a wall. Magic circles ignited above his eyes as he stared at something nobody else could see, and continued the steady stream of curses. From the other rooms he could hear the sounds of the rest of the team waking up and rolling from their beds, far too slowly for Rogel's liking. He'd drill them on it later. What is the danger? Dove you idiot. Why fuck? What? Is there a threat? I should fucking oh good lord, it's gone. Thank shit. Thank you holy goddess. Thank your pure melons and your blessed firm ass. Dove, Roger ground out. 
Can you stop blaspheming long enough to tell me what's going on? Or am I going to have to pound you into a bearded pile of goop first? The magic faded from the summoner's eyes as he finally seemed to realize his team leader had arrived in the room, followed by the rest of the team as they gathered outside his door. Are you telling me you didn't feel that? Are you fucking kidding me? Dove. An abyssal. He threw his hands in the air. Someone tried to summon a fucking abyssal. Here. In the keep. No, in town somewhere. They failed, thank goodness. Can you imagine the mage trailed away as he shivered? What is going on and why can I see Dove's balls? Aril the scout drawled as she peered over Monica's head. Dove looked down at his exposed genitalia, only realizing in that moment that he'd gone to sleep with a shirt on, but no pants. Deciding to lean into it, he turned toward the door with his feet planted firmly apart. Allow me to explain, the summoner gestured with his hand, managing to brush his nightshirt out of the way of his junk in the process. What is going on is I felt someone perform a ritual somewhere in town, a ritual that tore the veil. As to why you're looking at my balls, that's because you're a raging pervert. But it's okay, we love you anyway. Roger rolled his eyes. I couldn't care less about your dick or your balls. Try to imagine for a moment that none of us are specialists at pulling weird creatures from even weirder places, and break this down a little for us. And put on some pants, please, Monica begged. Her hands firmly cupped over her eyes. Fine. Dove strolled back to his bed and found his pants, as the rest of the team lit a few candles, and took a seat in the communal lounge, Dove joining them a few moments later. Okay. In basic terms, it's like this. There is a barrier that separates our reality from some truly heinous shit. That barrier is called the veil. Someone in Woodsedge poked a hole in the bloody thing, and something truly heinous tried to creep through it. You mean they tried to open a rift? A real frowned, they were summoning Rifkin. The summoner slapped a hand to his forehead before he looked up again. Actually, it might make sense to explain it that way. Yeah, think of the veil as something behind which a particularly horrendous brand of Rifkin lives, except under normal circumstances, rifts do not form between here and there, ever. Think of it as the walls being too thick, or the destination being too far away. Got me. I think so, Rogel nodded. So the only way to bring these particular Riftkin over is for someone to manually create the rift and let them through. It's a big no-no. One of the biggest no-nos. If I did something like that I'd be strung up by my testicles above the keep gate before they started torturing me. A real winced. Of course, this is a simplification. Abyssals are not Riftkin. They are much worse, and bringing them here is both easier and harder than opening a rift. You said they failed, Rogel said. Yes, they failed. Would I be sitting here in my nightclothes if there was a fucking abyssal wandering through town? You're sure? Of course, I'm fucking sure. By the perky spheres dash. Dove, Monica warned. Ahem, by the perfect name of the goddess. Yes, I'm sure. Each of them sat back in their chairs as some of the tension drained out of the room. Except from Dove. The summoner clasped and unclasped his hands as his leg bounced up and down. So what happens now? Rogel turned his mind to the future. Is this going to impact the team at all? Dove frowned. Molly Ape? The pitch of his voice rose toward the end of the word. I can say a few things for sure. I'm not the only one who felt that summoning. Not by a long stretch. There will be guards swarming through town as we speak, looking for the ritual site, and trying to kneecap out the summoner. It's possible that the keep might prevent expeditions leaving for the next few days. Don't give me that shit. We were heading out in three days. A real swore. The summoner raised his palms. I know, I get it. But I can tell you this for free. The first suspect is going to be the Slayers. Which means I'm likely to get my ass dragged off to jail before the night is done. What? Why? Roger blinked. Summoning a motherfucking abyssal is serious business. Serious. Business. You think some punk kid can pull that kind of magic? No. Someone with levels did this. Probably not too many, otherwise they likely would have succeeded. But levels nonetheless. Which means slayers are the primary suspect, as always, Aril said. What are you going to do? Dove shrugged. There aren't many people with the kind of control and power needed to pull this kind of shit. I'd come knocking on my door first if I was looking for a culprit, and there'll be a few others dragged out of the keep tonight as well. At that moment a deliberate and urgent knock rang out from the door, several raised voices coming from behind it. 
Doe stood casually and straightened his nightclothes before spreading his hands towards the other members of his team. How do I look? Chapter 20. You look like shit. Hacketh looked at the kid who stood leaning against his door, as if he might fall over if the wood went propping him up. He knew he'd been pushing him hard, but he didn't think he'd been pushing him this hard. He almost felt bad. Almost. I still expect a full day of work out of you. He warned the lad. Tyron just nodded. He didn't have the spare energy to bother trying to come up with a clever or even polite response. Instead, he just shuffled to the side. So the butcher had room to open his shop and took slow measured breaths to try and settle the food in his stomach. He'd made it back to the inn, somehow, and practically crawled up the stairs before slumping into bed, dried blood all over his face. He'd woken up three hours later feeling like burnt death, washed himself as best he could and staggered into town for his shift at the butcher's. At least he'd managed to put on fresh clothing. What he'd worn yesterday would likely need to be tossed into a fire. It was in no condition to be seen in public, and wouldn't ever be again, which meant more expenses. He sighed. He'd need to start earning money soon, and to have a better chance of that, he needed this butcher to teach him something. He worked through the day in a complete daze, moving on autopilot more often than not. He managed to summon enough focus to avoid any major errors, but he was still reprimanded by an irritated hackathon on several occasions. After he'd cut himself for the third time whilst sharpening the butcher cursed him and sent him out of the shop on delivery. But not before he carefully bandaged the wound with a poultice he kept in his workstation. Tyron didn't really fancy being out in the sun, or in public. But at least he wouldn't be able to actively harm himself with sharp objects. He blinked repeatedly to try and clear the grainy feeling from his eyes. As he stood in front of the desk, Madeline looking back at him with a concerned expression on her face. Tyron, are you okay? I'm just really tired. He tried to smile and failed utterly, looking more like a grimace. Maybe you need to take the day off. I can talk to dad about it if you want. In fact, I dash. No, please. It's fine. I just need to push through the day, get some sleep tonight, and I'll be right as rain tomorrow. I promise. If you're sure, I am. He leaned to the side a little too far and almost fell over before he caught himself. For real, he added. Right, she said. She looked down and rummaged through the neatly organized stack of pages next to the account book on the bench, causing Tyron's weary gaze to drop down almost against his will. Here, she said, pulling out a note and handing it to him. This delivery is to the Gilded Swan. It's three streets over, and all thereafter is a couple of hands. The food is good at the Swan, and I don't expect you back for at least an hour. She leaned forward to make sure she had his attention. Got that? He blinked. Slowly. You forgot to carry the four here. He pointed at a particular line in the ledger. Before he grasped the note and wandered toward the back of the shop. After a few long seconds a thought bubbled up in his head. Hum. Oh. Ah. Uh, thank you. He said turning back to Madeline with a bob of the head as he finally realized what she'd done for him. Under the watchful eye of Hack, he gathered the hands from the cool room carefully packed them before he hefted the box under his arm, and walked out through the front door, passing the butcher's daughter who was busy double-checking her figures. Though it was only a stone's throw away, in his befuddled state, it still took an embarrassing amount of time for Tyron to find it. Once inside he delivered the meat to the kitchen before he slumped into a chair, and took a moment to rest his eyes. Did you hear about the marshals? The merchant Phyllis was arrested for questioning this morning. Oh my. Tyron's eyes snapped open and he sat up quickly in his chair, too quickly as it turned out, almost falling off and catching himself at the last moment. His antics naturally drew the eye of the two serving maids gossiping near his table. Almost went on a trip didn't you? One laughed. You alright there, love? Yeah thanks, he didn't need to pretend to be embarrassed at his slip, must have dozed off there. Any chance I can grab a plate possibly an ale? Sure thing, I'll be right back. The older of the two smiled and took his order back to the kitchen as Tyron turned to the other. Sorry to intrude, but I heard you were saying something about a merchant getting arrested. Her eyes widened, and she leapt at the chance to continue to discuss the latest scandal. Yes, she leaned in conspiratorially. I haven't heard why, but my cousin Eustace is a secretary for the Crown Records at the Customs Depot, and she said the entire place was turned out by the marshals in the early morning. Dozens of people were dragged off to be questioned, including Phyllis, 
which is just shocking. Her expression said that he should share her amazement, but he had no idea why. Sorry. He grimaced slash smiled. I'm pretty new in town. Who's Phyllis? Oh, he's the richest merchant in Woodsedge, moves goods for the Slayer Keep, monster parts and rare materials as I understand it. Apparently they honed in on his warehouses most of all, and he was dragged out of bed and hauled down the street. I would have killed to have seen it myself. Sorry, Phyllis. Looks like the poor man must have been the owner of that empty building in the corner of the lot that he'd used last night. The serving girl continued to provide a steady stream of rumors and guesses as to the root cause of it all. Whilst Tyron tried to suppress the shiver running down his back, they turned up in the early morning. Exactly how long after he'd gotten out, barely functioning, did they arrive? He might have escaped discovery by a matter of minutes. And he wasn't out of the clear yet. He had no alibi for last night. Here you are love. House ale and a steak. Ought to put a little meat on your bones. He glanced up to see the other girl had returned to his table and placed a frothing mug alongside a plate loaded with meat, gravy and roast vegetables. The smell was fantastic, yet his stomach churned with the thought of his perhaps imminent arrest. Thanks so much, he managed, I appreciate it. Come on Liz, let's leave the young fellow to his meal. She reached to grab her co-worker and the two of them moved away through the common room, taking orders and clearing tables as Tyron sat his thoughts buzzing in his head. May as well eat. Think about everything else later. He hadn't been eating enough over the last few days, pretty much only a full meal for dinner. Despite his sudden lack of appetite, he forced himself to clear the plate and drink the ale. He wasn't normally a drinker, but after the night he'd had, something steadying was just what he needed. Didn't hurt that the house brew had a light fruity flavor, quite opposed to the heavy dark stuff his father preferred to drink. And did he detect a bit of honey? After finishing his meal he waited another 15 minutes for his stomach to settle, before he thanked the girls, and paid before he made his way back to Hackett's. He'd been gone a little over an hour as it turned out, but Madeline merely waved him in as she continued going through the books. The butcher only grunted when he reappeared and gave him more jobs to do. For the rest of the afternoon he continued to work but he felt as if the gruff man was going easy on him. It was possible that his daughter had a word with him, despite being asked not to. As it was he still felt completely drained at the end of the day, but as before he waited for Hacketh to lock up before leaving. I'm sorry about today, Mr. Hacketh. It won't happen again, he assured the butcher as he locked the door. He got a grunt as a reply, which was what he'd expected. He turned to leave only for the man to speak before he'd taken a step. See you tomorrow he said. See you tomorrow Mr. Hackett. Another grunt and the two parted ways, moving in opposite directions as night fell over the town. Despite everything he wanted to do, Tyron knew he was at the end of his rope. After another hearty meal that sat heavily in his stomach, he climbed the stairs, locked the door behind him, kicked off his shoes, and made himself comfortable in bed. He hadn't had to do it for a while, but he decided this was the perfect moment for a sleep spell which he cast easily thanks to his improved stats. The moment the magic was completed he felt his eyelids dragging down, as all thoughts of Marshall's and arrests faded to nothing and sleep claimed him. Elsewhere in Woodsedge, Marshall Langdon looked down at the dust-covered floor of what at one time had been a shed used to store Phyllis Moran's coach, and was now the center of a major investigation. The acrid tang of magic was still in the air, so thick he could almost taste it even all these hours later. He frowned as he crouched down and settled on his heels, as he looked over the remains of what had surely been a ritual circle. The caster had done well to obscure most of their work, but the telltale signs were still there, including the burn residue of what had been an arcane flame. Factors such as this could help them determine the exact spell that had been cast, which would help them drill down to a potential class and level of the caster. Langdon, a voice called from behind him, What is it Waller? He replied without taking his eyes off the ground. The summoner is here, the one I told you about this morning. He was cleared by the captain an hour ago, so I brought him straight over. Good, send him in. Some low voices exchanged words before the sound of soft footfalls entered his ears. Acute hearing was a very useful feat for an investigator to have. He didn't turn as a new presence made itself known behind him. Holy shit. Are you telling me this maniac just drew his protective circle in dust? That's insane. Certified insane. If I didn't see it for myself and someone told me I'd have punched both of us in the face. 
Mr. Levin, I presume. Please, call me Dove. Of course, Mr. Levin. The summoner sighed. It was going to be like that, was it? All right, may as well get on with it. Let me know what you need so I can get myself back to bed. No offense intended, but this hasn't exactly been a good day for me. As far as cells go, it was comfortable enough. But being innocent and incarcerated just rubs a man the wrong way. You know, as refreshing as your levity might be, Mr. Levin, I find the concept of an abyssal summoning and the hundreds, likely thousands of deaths, that would result from such an act of slightly more importance, that a day of your freedom. And if I didn't agree, I wouldn't give a shit. Now that you've been cleared of possible involvement, you can offer your expertise as the highest level summoner in the area, and then, as you say, go back to bed while we try and prevent this from happening again. The marshal had not turned around once during his conversation. He remained crouched low, his eyes roaming over the remnants of the circle as he spoke. After an awkward pause where Dove stood idly swinging his hands together, he decided to step forward. Well, I can take a look, but it might help if you can tell me what you've worked out already. That might save us both some time. The marshal began pointing at several things of note. The suspect is likely male. Judging by the size of the fort and length of the stride which you can measure there and over there. The circle was drawn with the index finger, most likely right hand based on the angle of the impressions. Entry to this room was gained through that window, no teleportation or apparition magic used. The guards neither saw nor heard anything, which leads me to conclude that the suspect either utilized a dampening spell or the guards are incompetent, likely both. He shifted his position to get a better angle on the center of the circle. It doesn't seem that the culprit was here for long. Two, maybe three nights were spent setting up the ritual, which speaks of both competence and confidence. My estimate is a mage, likely with a level in the mid-30s to 40s, a little shy of six feet tall, right-handed, and with extensive experience in summoning magic. Dove listened patiently, only to have his face sour as the description went on. Balls. I'm still under suspicion, aren't I? The Marshal finally stood and turned to face him. What do you think? Marshal Langdon asked him. I think that every time some shit goes down your morons find the nearest Slayer and start rattling their cage. The Marshal sighed. How often do you think a Slayer goes rogue out here, Mr. Levin? Take a guess. Dove just stared back at him, refusing to answer. Two per year, at least. There are always casualties. Innocents caught up in the fray, when one of you snaps. And you know something, most of those innocents are other slayers, murdered out on the job, or killed in their sleep. It's very hard to see it coming. I've never been able to. One day a perfectly fine slayer, maybe getting a little too close to the next rank up, just decides to go out with a bang. The summoner didn't blink. I find it a little hard to blame them sometimes, he admitted. Knowing what we know, do you? No, I don't. The two men stared at each other for a long moment before Dove shrugged and stepped around the other. Well, let me take a look. The faster we catch the prick who did this the faster I get my name cleared. And go back to doing what I truly love. Killing Rifkin to keep fine. Law-abiding citizens like you safe. After a moment magic ignited just beyond his eyes two rings of green light that rotated and flared as he carefully looked around the room. Well, I can tell you that whoever did this is batshit crazy. Drawing a circle by hand in the dust. That is the act of someone with truly, truly pendulous nads, or someone with an extreme level of skill. It's also smart. No ritual mediums. No wardings. No arcane focus. The spell residue is all kinds of fucked up. I can't read a thing, and that's because there was no container for it. The moment the spell collapsed it all went to nothing, which is clearly a deliberate choice on the part of the caster. Why do you think the spell failed? Well, I take it we're confident that the caster survived. The marshal nodded. Well, that rules out the most likely theory. If the spell was in fact a summoning, then it could have failed for a number of reasons. Lapse in concentration, ran out of juice, something spooked him, or he just ran out of time and ended the spell in order to make a getaway. You said if it were a summoning, it's possible that the caster merely wanted to contact the abyss as opposed to summoning an abyssal. From what I know there's all sorts of creepy shit you can learn, though as I understand it, most mages go mad when they try it. He may also have wanted to try and establish a contract with the creature, possibly for a summoning in the future. He paused for a moment and rolled his eyes. 
Which would be another reason that I'm suspect. Celine's tits this is a pain. Right. No teleportation magic also makes sense. You wouldn't want to do it anywhere near your ritual site. Since any disturbance to the dimensional weave could disrupt the spell. Whoever did this knew what the fuck they were doing. That's for sure. They also had to know that their spell would be detected. Which means they must have planned out a response to what will follow. You don't suspect a cultist. Dove waved a hand dismissively. Hell no. This kind of spellwork is hard. And more than that takes a damn tough mind. A cracked in the head lunatic doesn't have what it takes to pull this off. And the better put together ones have no reason to antagonize the authorities. And do it in the middle of a town. Not unless there is something going on much deeper than what I can understand. The marshal paused thoughtfully. Any idea what sort of class might have done this? Dove shook his head. Impossible to say. A summoner could. But they would have to be taught the spell since, as I'm sure you know, it isn't a class choice available to us. Dark Summoner on the other hand, definitely does get access. But they sure as heck don't advertise themselves. Tricky one would be a Dimension Mage. They're the real experts when it comes to spell work like this. What I do is of a very different flavor. Though they're both wine I suppose. As you suggested, an arcane cultist of some variety could have access to the spell. I sure as shit wouldn't know. Other than that, literally any mage with big enough balls to need a wheelbarrow to go walking and someone to teach them. What about a necromancer? The marshal asked. A what? Dove turned to face him, surprise on his face. Reports came in of a young man who unlocked necromancer in his awakening a week ago. In Foxbridge. Went rogue, currently missing. The slayer's face went slack for a moment as he gaped at the marshal, turned back to the circle, and then back to the marshal once more. Are you seriously suggesting that an 18-year-old kid who had his class for a week would be capable of something like this? Seriously. Langdon didn't reply. Dove pushed a hand through his wild and unkempt hair. Alright, look. As far as I know a low-level necromancer can't do shit except create basic undead. If one was somehow able to learn this spell and pull it off under these circumstances, then they would have to be the reborn god of fucking magic, Telenon himself. Chapter 21. Events? Your attempts at stealth have increased proficiency. Sneak has reached level 3. Concentration has increased proficiency. Concentration has reached level 4. You have performed a successful cast on the first attempt. Pierce the Veil has increased proficiency. Pierce the Veil has reached level 3. You have continued to please your patrons. The Dark Ones revel in the chaos you stir. The Court delight in your madness. The Abyss is pleased with the taste of your mind. Anathema has achieved level 4. You have received plus 2 intelligence, plus 2 constitution and plus 2 willpower. New choices available. Name. Tyre and Steelhand. Age. 18. Race. Human. Level 10. Class. Necromancer. Level 4. Subclasses. Anathema. Level 4. None. None. Racial feats. Level 5. Steady Hand. Level 10. Night Owl. Attributes. Strength. 12. Dexterity. 11. Constitution. 22. Intelligence. 28. Wisdom. 18. Willpower. 26. Charisma. 13. Manipulation. 11. Poise. 13. General Skills. Arithmetic. Level 5. Handwriting. Level 4. Concentration. Level 4. Cooking. Level 1. Sling. Level 3. Swordsmanship. Level 1. Sneak. Level 3. Butchery. Level 1. Skill selections available. 1. Necromancer skills. Corpse appraisal. Level 1. Corpse preparation. Level 1. Death magic. Level 1. General spells. Globe of light. Level 8. Sleep. Level 4. Mana bolt. Level 1. Necromancer spells. Raise dead. Level 3. Bone Stitching, Level 2. Anathema Spells. Pierce the Veil, Level 3. Mysteries. Spell Shaping. Int, Plus 3. Wiss, Plus 3. Anathema Level 4. Please choose an additional spell. Dark Communion Beg Intercession from the Dark Ones. Appeal to the Court Attempt to Commune with the Scarlet Court. Air of Menace Surround oneself in a Dread Aura. Suppress Mind Attack Another's Will. Please to touch his mind. Huh? Tyron shuddered. If he never had to deal with the damned abyss again he'd be more than happy. The entire experience had been a nightmare. The spell had pulled more out of him than he'd expected. How he'd managed to finish it he had no idea. 
If he'd attempted the spell shortly after he'd attained it, he'd have had no chance, and whatever had reached out to claim him would no doubt have succeeded. The memory of that alien presence within his mind clawing at his consciousness as something reached through the veil was enough to give him nightmares for days to come. Guess I'll be relying on the sleep spell for my shut eye in the near future. After he woke up feeling much refreshed, he'd decided to perform the status ritual and check for any changes. He was unsurprised he'd earned another level in Anathema after what he'd managed. Whoever these patrons were, they seemed to be enjoying themselves at his expense when they weren't trying to kill him. Still, the stats were nice to have, and who knows what might have happened if he'd waited longer to cast the ritual. Would things go even worse for him if he'd never cast it? Would those voices have found a way to punish him regardless? He had no idea. Worse, he had no way of finding out. Relax, he told himself as he took deep, slow and steadying breaths. You're still alive. Had the situation in Woodsedge gotten worse? Absolutely. But he had survived another trial, gained another level, and as of this moment, he wasn't in prison awaiting execution. Look for the positives. He sighed. Good to see Sneak gain another level, considering how much of a workout it had had recently. Butchery still at level 1 stung a bit, but he hoped that would start to pick up soon. He needed money, badly. His two necromancer skills still being stuck at level 1 pained him much more. He knew that class skills were key to raise, and as much he wasn't looking forward to preparing a corpse, the thought was almost enough to make him physically sick. But he knew it would be a key component of what would make him successful in his class. Other than that, Pierce the Veil had increased in level. Not that he intended to cast it again anytime soon. If ever. He could think that way for now. But there was little doubt that their messages through the status ritual would become insistent again eventually. When that happened, he would have to choose to enact the spell once more. Or take the risk that they could not harm him. At least if he did summon the courage to attempt to cast Pierce the Veil again the added levels would make it easier. With more research he might be able to build better protections into the magic as well. Some sort of barrier for the mind. He had no idea how to construct such a thing, but with study. He shook his head. Already he was considering how to cast it again safely. Was he even sane anymore? He was lucky the modifications he'd made to the circle had worked to his advantage. His mother dabbled on the edges of summoning magic at times, and the texts he'd read spoke repeatedly and urgently on the importance of some sort of defensive measures being built into the spell. Something else that was emphasized most strenuously was the importance of being able to end the spell when you wanted to. Neither of those elements had been present in any form he understood in the base spell. That had been planted in his mind, so he'd been sure to add them as best he could. It hadn't worked perfectly, but it had worked well enough. But now he had another choice to make. Anathema level 4 spells. The two choices he'd passed over previously were still here, as expected, along with two new choices. Air of Menace sounded odd. Some sort of intimidation magic. A dread aura. What the hell would be the point of that? Her was trying to keep his head down as much as possible, not advertise his presence through some area spell. At his level, even someone like Hacketh would likely be able to shrug off the effect and cave his head in, let alone an actual slayer. This choice didn't appeal to him much. Suppress mind. This one left a poor taste in his mouth. Cast a spell to attack someone's mind. That felt a little too much like what had happened to him when he performed the ritual. Having his thoughts invaded and disrupted had been a horrible experience. One that he wouldn't wish on anyone. If he had to pick one of the two new abilities though, he might just reluctantly pick this one. He could at least see it having a use as opposed to the other. He also had the option to choose another contact spell. But after what had happened last time, he didn't think he'd be doing that. He had no reason to assume that he'd get a better reception from the Dark Ones of the Scarlet Court than he'd gotten from the Abyss, and the thought of going through that again scared him. He could admit that to himself. No, those are out. Suppress mind it is. He marked his choice with blood before he ended the ritual and allowed the changes to roll over him. Growing stronger wasn't something he was likely going to get bored of anytime soon. And feeling his new power settle in his mind along with the fragments of his new spell. He couldn't help but smile and feel that his recent risks had been worth it. Hopefully he could now ignore the anathema subclass for a while. And devote himself to more necromantic pursuits in the near future. Though first he had some butchering to do. Once he'd steadied himself and grown accustomed to his new self, 
he disposed of the status sheet in the traditional way, by eating it, before he headed downstairs to wash it down with some proper food and drink. With that done, he waved goodbye to the kitchen staff who were surprised the gesture, used to the young man sliding more or less silently in and out of the inn, before he ran over to Hackett's shop just in time to beat him to the door. You're looking better, the butcher greeted him gruffly. I'm feeling better. Just needed a good night's sleep, he replied, standing as tall as he could. That got an amused grunt from the man, and the two of them headed into the store for another long day of work. Despite his more complete rest his muscles still ate fiercely, and the more physical tasks he was set to still hurt. But with his head so much more clear than the previous day, it was a comparative breeze. He thought he might have gotten an approving nod from the butcher at one point though he only caught it out of the corner of his eye as he shifted crates around. When she arrived, Madeline poked her head through the door into the back room to check on him, and he thanked her again for what she'd done for him the day before. Despite the hard labor, the day went by quickly enough, and by dusk he once again stood outside the door, rung out as he waited for the butcher to lock up. The two said their goodbyes and went their separate ways. This time when he got back to the inn, Tyron took a little time to speak with the staff, and enjoyed his meal in the common room, trying to establish himself as Lucas Armsfield in the minds of a few more people. If he wanted to blend in and appear less suspicious, then he needed to come out of his shell a little and start talking to people. With his meal done, he retreated upstairs once more, but instead of going directly to sleep, he decided to use the time to practice another spell he would likely need in the days to come. He hadn't had much cause to cast Mana Bolt ever since he'd earned the spell. Teaching oneself magic wasn't an easy task, and it had taken him over a year to get the hang of it, or at least learn it well enough, that his status acknowledged his ability, by having appear in his general spells list. It had been a grueling effort of trial and error, mostly error, but it had been worth it for the smile on his mother's face, when he'd finally revealed it. He smiled at the memory before he focused himself on the here and now. Concentrating, he channeled the magic, spoke the words of power, and thrust his palm forward, carefully managing the amount of energy he pushed into the spell. There was a flash of light as the spell manifested directly from the center of his palm, flying in a straight line forward, until it puffed harmlessly out against the wooden wall of his room. Just to be sure though, he walked over and carefully inspected the boards. It wouldn't do if he was to scratch obvious spell marks into the walls of his room, when he was trying to keep his head down. Satisfied there was no damage, he walked back to the other side of the room, and concentrated again. There were several aspects to the spell that had challenged him a great deal when was trying to learn it. The first of which was forming magic into something more corporeal that you could then project to smack into something. It was in the formation of this projectile that most of the difficulty lay, actually shooting the thing out wasn't hard at all. The palm gesture wasn't strictly necessary, merely an aid to concentration, though he'd need to work on eliminating it, if he wanted to look competent. Proper mages never needed to wave their hands around in a fight, using the prodigious power of their minds to achieve all that they needed. He'd certainly never seen his mother have to thrust out a palm or fist, she could unleash her entire arsenal of spells standing stock still. For now, he didn't worry about it, he was much more focused on improving the formation of the projectile itself. For a perfect cast, it should be almost invisible, none of the energy wasted on light or heat, and it needed to be quick, fast enough that he could snap it out in the heat of battle. So he continued to practice. Cast after cast, pausing every now and again to make notes in his book, as he worked on his proficiency with the spell. He needed to be able to cast it much faster, and under pressure for it to be useful. And there was a lot of work to go before he achieved that level. Deep into the night he continued to work, the slow, repetitive grind was soothing to his otherwise troubled mind. And he kept at it until at last exhaustion gripped him and he slipped into bed. Despite his immense physical and mental fatigue, he struggled to fall asleep. The memory of the abyss crawling through his head, like someone scratching at the inside of his skull, refused to go away. He tried to distract himself to think of other things, but that didn't help either. He thought of his parents. Where were they? What were they doing now? Had they found his note? How did they react? Flashes of memory bubbled up without his prompting. He remembered the tear-streaked face of Elsbeth as he brushed past her in the mausoleum, the shit-eating grin on Rufus's face as he pressed down on Tyron's sword. Filled with anger, 
fear and regret, he finally gave up and cast sleep on himself, allowing the magic to pull him down into the darkness, where dreams and nightmares could not touch him. The next day, Chop, with one ham-sized fist Hacketh brought his cleaver sharply down, the power of his class and skills behind the strike giving it almost supernatural precision and power. Flesh and bone parted beneath the knife-like paper as the leg was sheared from the carcass so cleanly, that if you held the two parts together, it would be almost impossible to see that they'd been cut at all. Hacketh knew this for a fact, since it was the test his old master Belag had demanded he pass before he'd been able to leave and establish his own shop. Across the room the lad leaned over the grindstone, focused on his work. I, but even so, the butcher could tell that he kept sneaking the old glance at him as he worked, trying to pick up the tricks of the trade through observation alone. He tried to contain a snort and kept working. If it were possible to learn by just watching then the kid would be the one to do it. He was smart as a whip, and never made the same mistake twice. Something that the old man appreciated, since he hated having to explain himself more than once. He had a bright future ahead of him that lad, or at least he would have had. Once again he felt his heart sink a little in his chest, as he contemplated what lay in store for young Lucas. Too many young ones went down that road, and so few came back. He shook his head. It wasn't any of his business. Tyron wouldn't be the first to try and learn his skills, only to go and get himself killed in the broken lands. And he sure as hell wouldn't be the last. Being young and a false sense of invincibility went hand in hand after all. It wasn't like Hack couldn't remember feeling the same as a youth. It was just such a damn waste. He drew back his hand for another clean slice, only to be interrupted by a powerful knock on the front door. Interrupted mid-swing. He threw down the knife with a muttered curse, and stomped out of the work area and into the front of the store. Madeline wasn't in today, busy helping her mother, so he was forced to man the desk himself, something he hated doing. Despite his best efforts, he could never manage to hold on to decent staff for long. Apparently he was difficult to work with, whatever that meant. Barely trying to keep the irritation off his face, he yanked open the door to see a young man dressed in spattered and filthy armor on the other side. What? He growled. The Slayer flashed a quick and easy smile, despite the clear signs of weariness and fatigue around his eyes. Clearly he'd been out on the rifts for some time. Got something for me. He rumbled to the man stood waiting outside. Hey there Hacketh, remember me. I'm Tillin, the shield guard. Hack grunted and peered at him for a moment. Two months ago, big armor bug. Tillin grinned. That was us. Got another one for you if you're interested. A runner this time. Hack raised a brow. Pay. The shield guard's smile slipped a little. Same as before. He offered. The butcher grunted and turned to walk back through the door. Bring to Thar back door. He called over his shoulder. Already done. Came the cheerful reply. When he opened up the double doors at the back of his shop, sure enough he found the rest of the Slayer team who he vaguely recalled, with their kill on a sled. It looked fresh, which meant they likely came across it on the way back. He took a deep breath through his nose, and felt the telltale sting of magic burn his skin. Even the kid could sense it. Hack could see his head jerk up from the corner of his eye. The runner they'd brought was a nasty critter from Nagrathan, weighed over a ton but was quick as the wind. The two bladed arms at the front were sharp enough to slice through a fully armored man, with enough force left over for the man next to him. How long? He asked. No rush on it. The lady who no doubt had pulled the sled, judging by the size of her, said, We won't be out again for a week most likely. Eight, he rumbled. Ignoring the slayers, he stepped forward to grip the reins at the front of the sled, and with a monumental effort, he slowly pulled it into the shop. Used to his attitude, the weary fighters brushed it off and headed back to the keep with a wave. After he positioned the monster, Hack closed the double doors and locked them before he turned back and sized up the beast once more. It was a big one, not as large as the critter he'd done last time, but that had been a different variety entirely. This one was a killer, no doubt about it. As he slowly stepped around the creature he could see the kid was fascinated with it, though he tried to keep his head down, and at his task, he kept sneaking little glances at it, when he thought he wouldn't be noticed. For a long moment the butcher pondered until finally he let out a long and weary sigh. Come on then lad, get here, he rumbled and waved him over. Confusion flickered over the face of the boy, 
before he carefully placed down the knife he'd been working on and stepped away from the grindstone. Yeah, daft enough to go and get killed try and tar fight something like this. He gestured to the horrific killing machine on the sled in front of them. Yeah, a hard worker and smart too. Way too smart tar waste on running errands for slayers. You sure you wanna do this? The lad's brows rose as the butcher unexpectedly tried to talk him out of his course of action. But there was never any hesitation in his eyes. Without bothering to defend his decision, he simply nodded. I'm sure, he said. Hack was surprised to feel a slight pang in his chest at those words, but he quickly shook it off. He must be getting soft in his old age. Eight then. Time you learn something about it then. The kid hesitated. Are you sure? He asked. This soon. Hackett stared at him. You'll want me to work you harder first. He drawled. The boy came to his senses and shook his head emphatically, which pulled a chuckle from the old butcher. Then let's see here. What sort of monster we got here then? Warrior cast cutter. Often referred to as a runner due to their speed. Fastest monster out of Nagrathan, the lad rattled off. Taken aback, Hacketh peered at the kid for a moment. K. Lucas. If yeah, so smart. What do you think is the valuable parts o' this ee beastie? I have no idea, Tyron shrugged. Guess. Probably the blade arms, they look useful. Some of this chitin might be good, looks like the sled might be armored with something similar. The core obviously. But I'm not sure where it might be. If any of the organs are useful for alchemy or anything. I don't know, though I suppose they would be. I, the butcher nodded. The tendons in the legs are good, strong and flexible, use them fur bows and such. The chitin here. Here and here is a good shape for a chest plate. Depending on size the sections here can make thigh and arm guards. We'll get to organs tomorrow. Bring me the cleaver you was working on, and I'll show you how Tar gets started on these critters. Filled with enthusiasm Lucas jumped to obey whilst Hacketh just felt old and tired. Another young one set on running to the rifts who likely wouldn't make it back. Too many heard of the broken lands, and all they could think of was the glory, the money, the levels and power. The butcher had been around long enough that all he associated with the broken lands was death. No place for a young man two weeks from his awakening. If he lived long enough, hopefully Lucas would learn the error of his ways. When you see enough dead bodies, people usually worked it out. Chapter 22 Silence reigned around the table in the Renner household, and Elsbeth felt like she could scream. She wanted to leap out of her chair and run out the door, or shake her father, or break down and cry or plea for forgiveness, but she did none of those things. Frustrated and hurt, she kept her head down and finished her food, not looking anyone in the eye for the duration of the meal. When she was finished, she pushed her chair back and stood, carried her empty plate to the bench where she placed it in the tub to soak, turned and walked to her room without anyone saying a word to her. The moment the door closed behind her the urge to scream and stomp her feet was almost overpowering but she held it in, barely. What would be the point? Almost by instinct she began to repeat the litany of Selene in her mind, a calming exercise she had been taught by the sisters when she was just a little girl, fascinated by the strange miracles that these robed women wielded, and the universal respect they garnered. Holy Mother shelter and guide me. Let your light fall upon me. When I walk in your grace none can harm me. Keep me pure as you are pure. Lest we... The words fell to tatters as she blanked, struck by the knowledge, the sure knowledge, that in the eyes of the goddess, she was no longer pure, no longer worthy. She had been rejected, judged not able to serve the being. She had devoted herself to her entire youth. The shame and guilt threatened too well up again, but she shoved it away before it could overwhelm her again. She had wept so many times since that day, and so many more since Tyron had left. When she thought back to the day of awakening now, all she felt was bitterness. The hope that had blossomed in her then had since turned to ashes, everything had gone wrong. Perhaps it wasn't the awakening that ruined everything. Perhaps it simply brought to light the flaws that were already there. The traitorous thought flitted to the forefront of her conscious mind before it retreated back into the shadows. Before she could squash it, there it would remain, resonating with uncomfortable truth that ate away at what she had believed to be true. Tyron was a necromancer, on the run from the law. She couldn't believe it. He'd always been quiet and studious. 
but she would never have thought the Pantheon would see fit to grant him a class such as that. She could remember the wild look in his eyes that night, and the terrifying flame that burned in the empty sockets of the skeletons. It was as if her old friend had vanished completely, replaced by something colder and darker. Then Laurel. And Rufus. She shivered and realized at some point she had sat on her bed and was staring at the wall. She was so tired, so numb. She glanced out the window. It was close to midday. They'd be leaving soon. Did she even care anymore? Would she ever care about anything again? Unable to convince herself one way or another, she mechanically stood and changed her clothes, combing her hair as she prepared to head out. When she emerged from her room, the house remained quiet and still, as it had been for over a week now. When she walked through the kitchen her father remained at the table, face stony as he traced the lines of the grain in the table surface. When she walked in he stirred himself and spoke. Elsbeth, he began. She didn't stop and walked through, calmly opening the door and shutting it behind her. She thought she should feel something as she ignored her father in this way. But curiously she didn't. She felt nothing at all. A few steps later she was out into the street and walking towards the smithy. There were few people in the streets right now. Few enough that she barely had to move in order to move around them. A pole hung over Foxbridge and had since the day that the Steelums had come home. Elsbeth, someone hissed from her left. What are you doing child? Surprised at being addressed, she turned to see the mayor's secretary. Jen and peering out her window. Mrs. Barbary, she said. What's wrong? Are you mad, girl? What if they find you? Who? The Steelums. If they see you, you'll be killed. Elsbeth felt only confusion at this sentiment. But the deadly seriousness of Mrs. Barbary's tone forced her to think on it. But why would they kill me? I was Tyron's friend. Everyone knows you went to arrest him. I did not. She flushed, a hint of anger breaking through. And the Steelums left town. Nobody has seen them since that day. Are you willing to bet your life on that? Elsbeth looked at the woman, really looked at her. In her eyes she saw concern, but more than that was fear. Fear that Magnan and Beery had put there. In that moment she realized that this was the same fear she had seen in everyone's eyes over the past days. They were terrified that the powerful slayers might decide they were no longer satisfied with just tearing down buildings and land, they might come for the people next. In displaying the might of a higher level slayer, the Steelums had allowed the fear that had lurked in the heart of every citizen of Foxbridge to boil over. Yet she didn't feel it. She might not agree with what Tyron's parents had done, but anyone who had seen them with him like she had knew that he was the only thing in this town that they cared about, asides from Worthy and Megan. Some might have felt that they didn't care about their son, considering how often they left him behind. But she knew that wasn't the truth, they doted on him. Yes, she said and turned away to continue walking. Perhaps people weren't avoiding her because of her rejection. Perhaps it was because they feared she was marked for death by slayers. She could only shake her head, as if people needed another reason to isolate her. She hated it. She hated this town. She'd volunteered her time and energy to help for years. Treated the sick, cared for their children, and they turned on her this quickly. When she looked around at what should be familiar sites, buildings she had known her entire life, instead she felt like a stranger. She didn't glance at the temple as she strode past, and soon enough she found herself on the outskirts of town, the cobblestone road giving way to hard-packed dirt, as the smithy came into sight. Rufus already stood out the front waiting, Laurel nowhere to be seen at this time. When she realized it would just be the two of them, Elsbeth almost turned around and walked back home, but something inside her refused to back down. And after a moment of hesitation, she firmed her resolve and walked forward. When he saw her coming, Rufus smiled a crooked smile, and she felt a flash of anger in her chest. Hi, she said, stifling her emotions. Hey Beth, he said as he moved to walk towards her, but paused when she took a sharp step back. He sighed. I suppose you didn't change your mind and decide to come with us. She stared at him as if he were mad. No, she said coldly. Sorry if that ruins any of your carefully laid plans. The man's face hardened. Don't believe everything that shit had to say, Beth. I've always cared about you. You know that, right? As a matter of fact, she didn't. When she heard the venom in his voice when he referred to their missing friend, she realized that perhaps she had never known her friends at all. Why do you hate him so much? She wondered aloud. 
What did Tyron ever do to you? When she said his name a ripple of anger overtook Rufus's expression before he could hide, and suddenly it was as if he could no longer be bothered to conceal it. He spat to the side, the contempt plain on his face. Because he's a worthless piece of shit who had everything he ever wanted handed to him on a silver plate. Because he looked down on all of us his entire life. You might not have noticed, but I sure did. He thought we were trash the day we met him when we were six years old, and that never changed. Shocked at his tone, Elsbeth could only shake her head in denial. You felt this way about him, this whole time. You were this jealous of him. Jealous? Rufus spat. Of course I was jealous. While I lived under the thumb of a deadbeat fuck, he turned and hold the curse back at the unkempt smithy, who beat me as often as he fed me. That prince lived under the protection of the two most powerful people in the province. Elsbeth glanced toward the building warily, and Rufus sneered. He's passed out drunk. I put a bottle on the table after breakfast, and he snatched it up like a fish going after bait. What about your mother? Elsbeth asked quietly. If he was angry before, he was now incandescent with rage. Don't talk to me about my mother. He bellowed before he gathered himself. She's tougher than you think. She'll be fine until I get back and take her away from this shithole. Rather than sympathize, Elsbeth felt her heart grow cold as she looked at this person who only a few short days ago, she had held hopes of a future together with. So that's it then, she said slowly. You just wanted to get out of town. Get out from under the thumb of your dad and make it big as a slayer. You befriended Tyron and me because you thought we could help you. I could turn out to be a powerful miracle healer and Tyron might be a mage. Or he might just help out with money and contacts. You never cared about any of us. You never cared about me. Rufus stared at her for a long moment. Pretty much, he admitted. It's not like you wouldn't get anything out of the deal. Power, money, fame. You would get to help people by fighting off the rifts and keeping everyone safe. Isn't that what you wanted? What I wanted, she spat, was to serve Celine. Something I can't do anymore. I never heard you say no, he smirked. Boiling hot rage burned in her veins in that moment. So hot she could barely think, barely see. But along with it came the shame. He was right. He may have led her on, but she had willingly gone. She'd thought he'd felt something for her, thought they might be together. Now those dreams were all dust along with those naive feelings. You're a bastard, she ground out, surprising herself with her own anger. She wiped the tears from her eyes with her sleeve as she glared at him. I hope I never see you again. The grin slipped from his face, and the handsome swordsman sighed once more. He hadn't wanted things to turn out this way, but it was what it was. From that point on the two pointedly ignored each other as they waited for Laurel to arrive, which she did shortly after, but not from the direction they expected. Hey, Elsbeth, she called with a long languid wave. Didn't expect you would come. I'm not sure why I did, she replied. If her tone had any effect on the huntress, it didn't show. Laurel just shrugged and glanced at Rufus. You ready? She asked. Yep. Yeah. Where did you come from? He asked, wondering why she'd come from the opposite direction from her house. I went and took a look at the Aaron farm, she said, and the two looked at her, surprised. What? It's incredible, the whole place is flattened. That's good to you, Elsbeth asked. Good. Laurel seemed to chew the word over for a moment. I don't know if it's good. I don't really care either. It's impressive. Two people did that. Two. The idea seemed to spark something in her. Elsbeth looked at her and thought her smile seemed almost hungry. Is that why you're going? With him. She tilted her head to the swordsman who she still refused to look at. So you can be powerful. Laurel looked at her for a moment before she nodded. Of course, she said. I just don't want to stay here forever. I'd die of boredom. And I refuse to be weak in a world ruled by the strong. Are you really telling me you have been happy staying in this place your entire life? Slaving away to help people who refuse to help themselves. Yes, she whispered. It had been her life calling. Then out of the two of us. I think you're the one who's nuts. She shrugged and hitched her bow more tightly over her shoulder. Imagine what would have happened to us if we'd actually caught Tyron and brought him back. Do you really think that they'd have left us alone? We'd have been dead without even seeing the blow that killed us. I'm not going to be powerless in this world, Elsbeth. I refuse. For a moment the normally lazy eyes of the Huntress lit with fire. But then the moment passed, and she turned to Rufus. 
Come on then, meathead. Time to hit the road. Behind her, Rufus grabbed his pack off the ground along with the rough-looking sword in the well-beaten scabbard he'd leaned against the stone fence. Doubtless something he'd stolen from the smithy. See you, Elsbeth, he said. Good luck with everything. Just go away, she said. She didn't wait for them to leave. Instead, she turned on her heel and strode back into town, leaving them in her wake. As she watched her go, Laurel smiled a little thinking that the priestess might have finally grown a little spine. Then she pushed her from her mind and focused instead on what was coming next. The Slayer College. Avoided by the rest of the townsfolk, the two began the long journey east as Elsbeth walked home, her burned emotions congealing in her stomach in one queasy mass. Elsbeth, stop right there, her father demanded as she strode through the door. Don't you dare ignore me again. Oh, like you've ignored me for a week, she retorted. The fire in her words took her father back, too used to his sunny, obedient daughter. Spurred on by his reaction, she kept going. In the time when I most needed you, when I was most hurt, you turned your back on me. And now you want me to come to heal. You want me to curtsy and be thankful. Her voice grew louder and louder as she spoke until she was shouting, and her red-faced father bellowed back at her. Foolish girl. You think you can come here and speak to me like this after what you did? Fuck you, Elsbeth spat, and as her speechless father recoiled from the unexpected vitriol, she stomped out of the house. A few minutes later she found herself pounding on the door of the Steelham Inn as baffled townsfolk watched from their windows. The inn had been closed since Magnin and Beery had left, but Elsbeth wasn't to be dissuaded, and continued to smack her fist into the wood until it was red raw. Finally it creaked open and a devastated looking worthy looked down at her through the crack. What do you want, Elsbeth? He asked, his voice so, so weary. Suddenly the righteous fire leaked out of her, and she just felt sad. Against her all the tears welled up in her eyes, and she tried to blink them away. But they wouldn't stop. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about Tyron. And what happened? I didn't know what was going on and I was so worried. A, and now, I don't have a place to stay. And I was H hoping I could sleep here tonight. She stammered as the tears began to flow freely. As he looked down on the poor girl, Worthy's expression softened. Of all of Tyron's friends, he'd always known that this was the good one. Too bad she was caught up with the others. All right, lass. Come on in. We can put you up tonight and tomorrow we can go have a word with your parents, all right? He pulled open the door and called for Meg, and before she knew it, Elsbeth was tucked into bed, a full meal in her belly, and no more tears left in her. And then she dreamed. She dreamed of the gods, of Selene, of Hama, Telenon and Orphris. Four figures seated on golden thrones, bathed in light. Their radiance was so bright she shied away from them as they turned toward her, judgment in their eyes. In her dream, she fled, through the realms, down roads and into forests until she was no longer running, but pulled faster and faster as was drawn deeper, further, away from the light, away from those thrones that burned. She felt calm wash over her as she fell through the world, through time itself, until she found herself in a place beyond, a place that reeked of age. It was a forest, one that groaned under the burden of its years, where every bough was weighed down by time, and even the shadows had history. I don't think I've ever been somewhere like this. She mused to herself as she turned, finding only foreboding woods in every direction. Of course you haven't, child of the four, a voice came to her from amongst the shadows. They desperately wish that all mortals would forget this place, to expunge it from their minds as if it had never been, but still it persists. The old things are like that. They are difficult to remove. Still that strange calm lay on her. Deep down she felt a bubble of fear, she ignored it. Where am I? She asked dreamily. You have been invited, child, a very rare boon indeed. There are so few who get the chance. These days, you should feel blessed. I do. She smiled as she turned and looked at the ancient world around her. Phantom nails began to claw at the inside of her mind. Her own. But I don't know where I am. Or to whom I should feel grateful. Of course, I would be honored to correct this. Where you abide right now has had many names but I fear none will be familiar to you. Think of this realm as the dark forest, as to whom you should extend your gratitude. Well now, that is quite the tale as well. The old gods are not accustomed to introducing themselves, so I will take the task upon myself. And who are you? She said, a soft frown creasing her brow as her stomach churned with a distant panic. 
A scream welled up in her throat only for it to disappear as suddenly as it had appeared. There is no need for your fear, the voice purred. The Dark Ones do not need your fear. They have drunk deep on the terror of mortals. It is your devotion that they crave. Chapter 23 Did you hear about the necromancer on the run? Tyron's ear jerked, and he nearly dropped his cutlery when he heard that. He tried to act calm and pass it off with a cough, but he doubted he'd be winning any awards for his acting skills. He continued to eat as he turned his head to better eavesdrop on the couple seated behind him in the common room. I hadn't. A necromancer you say? Isn't that a rare class? Very. What's more, you know the Steelums. Of course. It's their son. You're shitting me? Wallace. Watch your language. I apologize my dear, you took me by surprise. Are you sure of this? I am. You can see the notice posted on the bounty board outside the marshal's office. Well that's quite an unfortunate thing. Imagine dedicating your life to protecting the kingdom and having your own child outlawed just terrible. Oh it gets worse. The woman's voice lowered as she leaned into her husband. From what I was told, the Steelums were charged with arresting the boy. Tyron sucked in a breath so fast he almost inhaled his cutlery. And immediately erupted in a fit of coughing. That resounded throughout the room. A number of people turned to see what the disturbance was and he waved weakly to them, once he managed to get his breathing under control. But within his heart was pounding to the point he felt his ribs might break. His parents, sent to hunt him down. It was so cruel, so needlessly cruel. There were hundreds of people they could have sent to do it. Why did it have to be them? Wouldn't it be a ridiculous waste of resources to have literally the two strongest people in the entire province? Hunt down a low level, newly awakened like him. It was insane. It was also hopeless. Frustration and despair welled up inside him as he realized what this meant for him. They would have to obey Magnin and Beery. Tyron didn't know how or why, but he knew that it wasn't possible for the high level slayers to refuse orders, which meant they would come for him eventually, even if they put it off as long as they could, they would still come for him. And what was he supposed to do? How was he supposed to fight back against them? His hands cold into fists on the table as he realized the hopelessness of the situation. No matter what he did, he was going to get caught. There was nowhere he could go where he could avoid them. There was nowhere he could run where they wouldn't find him. He may as well try and run from the wind or hide from the air. He'd studied his parents' career as only an admiring child could. He knew what they were capable of better than almost anyone. He had absolutely no illusions about his ability to avoid them. Which meant he would have to fight them if he wanted to remain free. Which was a joke. How was he supposed to fight his own family? Impossible. And even if he could bring himself to do it, what difference would it make? He may as well try and defeat the sun. They were so far above him, even the slayers in the keep here, each and every one of whom could snap him like a twig, would stand no chance against either of them, let alone both. The young necromancer fought back tears as he tried to stifle the overwhelming feeling of frustration that burned in his chest. Just like that, his future had been cut off. Despite the risks he had taken, and the effort he'd put in, it no longer mattered, had never mattered. He was on a clock. Eventually he would be caught, dragged in and sentenced. It was only a matter of time. The only thing left to determine was what he would do with the time he had remaining. Are you alright? A concerned voice came from behind him. Ah, Wah Tyron jumped and turned to see the couple who had been speaking regarding him with worried expressions. I was wondering if you were well, young man, you had a coughing fit, and you've sat trembling ever since, the husband told him. With a start Tyron realized it was true, even now on the table in front of him, his two fists were visibly shaking. He snatched them into his lap under the table, and tried to force a smile. I am alright, he said. I just just had my food go down the wrong way. A and I was surprised to hear what you were talking about. Something about the Steelums arresting their own son. The wife, Yasmin he thought her name was, nodded emphatically as he asked about their discussion. Yes, scandalous. From what I hear there was almost a break here in Woodsedge. And what does the Baron have his two Platinum Slayers doing? Forced to hunt for their own child. How terrible she grimaced and the husband, Wallace, nodded sympathetically. From what I heard through the post, they didn't take it lying down though. Smashed an entire farm and half a graveyard after being given the orders. The marshals are outraged. But what are they going to do? Arrest them. 
The look on her face suggested she'd like to see them try. Whilst Tyron tried to swallow the lump in his throat, of course they did. His heart went out to Mayor Aaron, but he knew Magnin and Beery. They were always going to lash out when given an order like that. He couldn't help but allow a wry smile to crease his lips as he thought of the two of them throwing their tantrum. Well, thanks for sharing. He told the couple as he gave them a polite nod and turned back to his own table, piling his cutlery neatly in the bowl. Before he pushed back the chair and stood being sure to push the seat back under the table before he left. Worthy would clip his ear if he made life hard on the serving staff by blocking their paths with his own laziness. As he walked toward the butcher's shop, his mind spun with what he had learned. When he tried to think of what he should do, he felt numb, as if the future, which had not long ago been a difficult road filled with challenges, was now a void as if it had never been. His path had been severed so sharply he couldn't even feel the pain of the cut. He'd always known that someone would be sent to hunt him down, if the marshals failed to find him but he'd assumed he would have more time. He'd assumed that a regular Slayer team would be given the job, not the Century Slayer and the Battle Witch. It was like snapping a twig with a battle axe. Without even realizing it, Tyron had been stuffed in a cage that he couldn't hope to break out of. All that was left for him was to rattle the bars until his inevitable capture. Obviously his parents weren't happy about it either, judging by what they'd done in Foxbridge. If there was one thing in the world that those two hated more than anything else, it was being told they had to do something. He'd long suspected the reason they'd based themselves so far away from the centers of power and wealth, despite reaching the rarefied heights of platinum-ranked slayers, was that they avoided being told what to do more often than not. Certainly they were asked to take care of this problem, close that rift, kill this monster, but those were the sorts of things they would have done anyway, even if nobody asked them. Roaming about the place fighting Riftkin was basically the only thing they liked. Besides each other, and him, he could only imagine the rage they must have experienced. He felt terrible that he had forced them into that position. Though in truth it wasn't really his fault. He hadn't asked for this class after all, only made the choice that he would keep it. He felt confident that Magnan and Beery supported that decision. It was what they would have done in his place, of that he had no doubt. Whatever means had been employed to force his parents to obey must be dreadful indeed if even they couldn't overcome it. He desperately hoped that they didn't suffer. No wonder they had unleashed such destruction upon the mayor. No wonder they had lost control to the degree they did. He could imagine their need to unleash their anger. Despite their great power and innumerable good they'd done protecting others, his parents were selfish creatures. Their desire to smash the nearest thing they could when they were enraged was perfectly understandable to him, the person who knew them best. When he thought of that destruction, his feet stilled on the road for a second as a thought struck him, before he resumed his pace. Magnan and Beery had thrown a tantrum and taken their revenge against Mayor Aaron in one fell stroke, but was there more to it? The more he considered it, the more he felt that this level of retribution, the scale of the devastation seemed excessive even for those two. Doing something this obvious, this loud was always going to reverberate around the western province. In another week there probably wouldn't be an inn or tavern in even the smallest village which hadn't heard of it. Perhaps they were trying to reach him. What if they'd been trying to send him a message? Fight. They were going to fight against their fate, they wouldn't accept it lying down. He could believe that of them. They were the least controllable people he'd ever heard of. Not even their love for him was enough to keep them pinned in one place. Trying to force them to hunt him against their will. They would fight it every step of the way. And they showed that immediately by lashing out at Mayor Aaron. They would fight against it. Which meant he should do the same. He had little faith in his own ability to overcome the odds. But those two. They'd been doing it their entire lives. Perhaps he'd been wrong to despair so quickly. There was still hope, still a chance. He might see it now, but they would, which meant he had to be ready. They would buy him the time he needed, so he had to keep pushing. And perhaps, just maybe, somewhere down the line, an opening would present itself, whereby he could continue to be free. Slowly the hopelessness leached out of him, and he was left feeling drained of emotion, weak from the waves that had rocked him one after the other. But there wasn't time to lose, he couldn't stand around doing nothing. If his family was going to risk everything in order to buy him time, then he couldn't afford to waste a second. Once more filled with purpose, he lengthened his stride toward his destination, determination welling up. When he finally arrived at the butchers, 
Hack was already there, slotting his key into the door. When he saw Tyron striding up to him, he paused as he recognized something different in the boy's eyes. Already, he shook his head as the lad stopped in front of him. You mean ta break your word so soon? I don't want to break my promise, but I do feel compelled to get out there. He replied in a measured tone, you've been patient and more than fair. What you've taught me over the last few days is something I never would have been able to learn on my own. And he meant it. Working together with the experienced hack dismantling had been a fantastic learning experience. The man had been an endless stream of good advice, tips and tricks, as well as detailing ways to make the work easier in the field. I'd be more than happy to make up the rest of the time I promised you when I'm in town, Tyron offered. I don't want to shortchange you. Hack snorted. Ta be fair, the reason I keep Ye here so long is Ta try and convince you not to throw Ye life away. Don't look like that'll work, will it? Tyron chuckled and shook his head. Was never going to. The butcher shrugged. Can't blame an old man for trying, he rumbled. He was a good man, Hacketh, and under different circumstances, Tyron would have been more than happy to finish out his time, learning how to properly butcher, before he moved to the next part of his plan. But what he'd learned this morning, meant he just couldn't afford the time. He didn't want to rush, but the world wasn't going to wait for him. Right then Lucas, the big butcher extended his hand. I'll see you at work when you get back. Thanks Mr. Hacketh. Shut up. The two shook hands, and then Hacketh turned back, stepped into his shop and was gone, leaving Tyron standing in the street in the early morning, with a heck of a lot to do all of a sudden. It was still early in the morning, likely there wouldn't be any Slayer teams heading out into the Broken Lands anytime soon, so he had some time to prepare. His mind started racing as he considered all the things that he needed to organize, and it took him several long seconds to realize that despite all the thinking he was doing, he still hadn't moved a step. Shit. His wits about himself once more, he sped off to the Iron District only to realize halfway he hadn't brought his money, which necessitated a sprint back to the inn which left him gasping and wheezing. He really needed to work on his fitness. His coin purse in hand, he returned to the market and engaged in a spending spree. That left his finances in a dire state when he was done. For the expedition to come he would need to supply his own equipment, and the more he could bring the more attractive he would be to potential employers. He just hoped he hadn't forgotten anything in his rush. He hauled back the goods to his room and immediately set about packing. His bedroll and other assorted traveling gear were inspected minutely before being stowed away, along with his newly acquired butcher's gear, travel rations, and a small stash of mage candy. Sword on his hip, brand new stave in his hand, he ran through his mental checklist one more time and found nothing amiss. Stepping out he locked his door before rushing down the stairs and out the door, before the serving girls had a chance to ask him what the rush was. Off he ran through the streets towards the north gate, a glimmer of childish excitement budding in his chest. To be a slayer like his parents and stride the broken lands, battling the creatures of the rifts was the first dream of just about everyone he'd ever met, and if he was lucky, he might just be stepping out there this very day. It was hard not to get excited. Heart thumping, he barely noticed the change in scenery around him as he drew closer to the gate. There were fewer pedestrians and shops. The few merchants operating in the area, specializing in either emergency medical treatment or weapons. Here too could be found the four temples in Wood Sedge, such that the slayers would pass them by as they left the keep and made their way out of the town. When the gate finally came into view, Tyron also got to see something else for the first time. His competition. Lining the road he could see a hundred, perhaps even more, young adults. Just like him, the newly awakened hopefuls who'd rushed to the border in the hopes of making a new life for themselves, gaining levels bit by bit, until they finally qualified as full slayers. Graduating from these streets into a life of danger and glory up in the keep. He slowed down as he drew closer and tried to take it all in. There were all sorts assembled here, young men and women in patchwork armor, wielding beaten up swords and axes alongside other hopefuls in robes or even rags. Some held signs declaring their skills and qualifications painted with varying degrees of mastery over spelling. Some of them would be farmhands, unwilling to resign themselves to their fate of working the land, Others would be young mages, rangers or fighters who couldn't afford any sort of education, submitting themselves to a baptism of fire, in order to transform their lives. He could sympathize on multiple levels, 
His arrival did not go unnoticed, and many others eyed him with disgruntled expressions. He realized immediately that he stood out from the others in a few ways. The quality of his gear and clothing did not mark him immediately as poor, unlike almost all of the others, not to mention the clearly expensive blade on his hip. Rather than a desperate newly awakened hoping to join a Slayer team as a hired hand, he looked like a merchant's son. He almost considered heading back to the inn to change, but decided against it at the last minute. He was here now so he might as well stay and see if he managed to get himself hired. He set his teeth and strode forward aiming for a less crowded area where he could comfortably stand without taking up someone else's space. It definitely appeared as if the area of the street closer to the keep was the most hotly contested area, which made sense, since those were the people the Slayers would see first on their way out. Of this stretch of road he ended up placing himself two-thirds of the way to the gate towards the tail end of the crowd. As he took up his position and tried to look competent but not expensive, the girl to his right smiled up at him from her position, sat in the grass. First time, she asked after a few awkward minutes had passed of Tyron, maintaining the same pose and expression to the point of cramping. That obvious. He sighed. Oh yeah, she grinned. Not to worry. I was pretty much the same at the start. Fucking desperate to make the right impression I was. He looked down at her lounging posture on the ground and frowned. So what changed? He asked curious. Oh, you still need to make the right impression, don't get me wrong. But if I'm going to be out here in the sun all bloody morning, then I'm going to make myself comfortable. When a team comes out of the keep, you'll have plenty of time to make yourself look presentable before they reach here, trust me. Tyron eyeballed the distance and figured she was probably right. From where he stood, the milling crowd of hopefuls blocked sight to the keep anyway. Sighing, he rolled his pack off his shoulder and sat down. The girl smiled at him and extended a hand. I'm Scylla, she said, welcome to Victory Road. Chapter 24 Scylla turned out to be a talking and likable companion, as the time wild away. The two continued to chat as those around them cast them odd glances and continued to stand at attention as much as possible. So, I thought this was called Northgate Street, Tyron asked. But you called it Victory Road. She smiled, her dark brown eyes twinkling in amusement. That's something I got from the Slayers. That's what they call it. Not sure exactly why. Apparently just about every keep has a Victory Road, a glorified name for a street that takes them straight to hell. Morbid fuckers. Tyron glanced up and down the rather plain cobbled road and solid, but ordinary looking gate at the end of it. Little ordinary looking for a gate to hell, don't you think? She looked at him sideways. You've never been out there, right? He had to shake his head. No, I've never set foot in the broken lands. He'd heard about it his whole life though, from two who knew it better than most. It's hell out there, she told him emphatically. Let me tell you, most of these pricks haven't gone out yet and a good chunk of those who manage to come back won't ever go twice. Surprised, Tyron's brows rose and he contemplated the people around them. Truly, they quit after their first run. An unladylike snort erupted from Scylla. abso fucking lootly they do. Those that make it back anyway. Around half don't come back at all. She turned and leered at him. It's a graveyard out there, Lucas. Make sure you don't piss your pants. He rolled his eyes. My pants are perfectly dry he said, but I'm surprised to learn that so many don't come back. Weak, the young man rumbled from beside them. Too weak for the job. Fat as farm boys who should have stayed home milking cows. He leaned over the road and spit. Lucas, this is Rel. Scylla introduced him with a hand on his back. He's been around for a few months and gone out three times already. Too stuck up to sit with us Riff Raff though. Rel frowned. You never know when the Slayers might be watching. They could have people scouting the road right now. I highly doubt it, she replied. They give roughly zero shits about us at the best of times, and I'm rounding up. Although he didn't say anything, Tyron nodded, since that lined up with what he knew. Slayer rats, or just rats? Hirelings that proper slayers took out into the rifts with them were there to do the dirty work that they couldn't be bothered or didn't want to do themselves. Whatever. You do things your way and I'll stick to mine. How many times have you been out anyway? Uppity cunt. You know I've only been out once. You're still here at least. Damn right I am. You've been out there. Tyron asked, failing to mask the surprise in his voice. Scylla flicked him an angry glance. Yes. Why? 
You didn't think I was good enough. He raised his hands quickly in defense. No, no, I just figured most of the people here hadn't so the odds were against you. I can't say if you're good enough or not, I know nothing about you. His explanation seemed to mollify the fiery girl, and she sat back to make herself more comfortable with a huff. Not bothering to hide it, Rel gave her the finger before he straightened his posture once more. Tyron realized then that the two didn't advertise themselves in the same way that others did. They didn't have any crudely drawn signs, boards or bits of paper, with their status and skills, scrawled on to show their qualities like so many who lined the road did. Curious, he remarked on it to Scylla, and she barked out a harsh laugh. Like whores on Night Street, I swear to the four, it's demeaning. If we have to be here hanging on the goodwill of the Slayers, then we might as well have a little dignity about it. Dignity. That's a little rich coming from you, Rel sniped. Shove it, Rel, she replied easily. Shove it in deep until you start to like it. To answer your question, no, Lucas. I don't bother with that garbage. And neither does Rel because we have something that the others lack. Which is, he prompted her when she didn't continue. She grinned at him. A team that is willing to hire us again. I did well enough my first time out that they said they'd take me out again. It's not a guarantee, since our employers are flakier than a bakery. But it's better than waving a sign around and slapping my ass while the teams walk past. Tyron whistled in appreciation. I can see how that makes a difference. If that's the case though, why are you here at all? Won't they contact you directly? Rel snorted, but refused to elaborate. The girl beside him reached out a hand to plant it on his shoulder as she gave him a pitying look. Lucas, you need to remember what you are to them. A rat. You're not quite the shit on the bottom of their boot. Oh no, you're the garbage monkey that they pay to lick it off. Contact us directly. We're lucky if they even tell us what day they're going to head out. So if you aren't here when they leave, they just take someone else. That's shitty. I was going to say poor form, but yeah. Shitty. That's just the thing, Lucas. It isn't. That's how you treat rats. And a rat is what you are now. Your life is as cheap as bread. And you are one of the most replaceable chumps in the entire province. How many fresh faces do you think we get every week here, Rel? Can't you leave me out of it? The young man complained. You've been here longer so you have a better idea than me. Just spit it out. I'm going to line up further down next time. I swear it. Look, the awakening happened recently, so there's at least a dozen new faces every day. They'll probably keep trickling in for months as kids decide to throw down their tools and run away from their apprenticeships to try and make a new life killing Riftkin. When I got here it wasn't nearly as busy as it is now. It doesn't look too crowded, Tyron said as he peered up and down the line. Huh. Half of us aren't even here yet, Scylla grinned. Give it a little time. So saying, she lay back, her head resting on her pack as she prepared to while away the time, and Tyron had little choice but to wait. And wait. As the hours ticked past and the sun rose higher overhead, her prediction proved more than correct. A steady flow of young faces, some more weathered than others, made their way to the side of the road until it became quite crowded on both sides. The air of desperation and hunger in the air was palpable, as the rats jostled for position and snapped at each other over the slightest thing. By the time the sun reached its zenith, Tyron was hot, bored, and three fights had broken out. Two teams had returned in that time, the only events that broke up the monotony. A shout from the guards above the gate was the first hint something was happening, followed by the gate creeping open just wide enough to allow the bedraggled and weary slayers inside whereupon the heavy wood beams slammed shut behind them. In these moments, Tyron found that the gathered rats became still and respectful, not wanting to make a bad impression to a potential future employer. From his observation, he didn't think it mattered much. The slayers looked tired, injured and in no mood to deal with the horde of wannab killers who lined the street. He wagered that anyone who actually attempted to bother them as they made their way back to the keep or to a healer was likely to get a leg locked off for their trouble. Two hours after lunch and now he wasn't just hot and irritated, he was hungry as well. He even thought of taking out some of his rations, but decided against it. If he didn't end up getting hired today, a prospect that appeared increasingly likely, then he could fill up when he got back to the inn. Are uh, there usually so few teams leaving? He finally asked his two companions, exasperated. We haven't seen a single group leave in the last four hours. 
It's a bit unusual, Rel admitted, still standing next to where Tyron sat. But not super uncommon. Sometimes you might go a whole day or two with nobody heading out only to have half the keep run out the gate the next morning. And we wait here the whole time. We do if we want to get hired. Tyron sighed. As it turned out, there was a team that left later that day. A hushed whisper of excitement rippled down the line of waiting hopefuls from those closest to the keep, and Tyron looked up to see the others straightening themselves, and putting their best foot forward. Before he realized it, Scylla had leapt to her feet and assumed a more disciplined posture. No sign of her earlier lounging to be seen. She looked down at him and winked. Show time, Lucas. Up you get. He blinked a few times before it clicked and then he scrambled to his feet. He wasn't sure how to hold himself, so he ended up folding his arms across his chest in an attempt to look as if he might actually know what he was doing. A few minutes later the Slayers themselves walked past, a group of five bedecked in armor, packs on their shoulders, and weapons polished to gleaming. They glanced here and there at the gathered crowd, but didn't bother speaking to anyone, and soon the gate slammed shut behind them. Scylla sighed and slumped back down to her seated position. They didn't even take anyone. Rude. Probably on a longer trip. So they picked up a loose slayer to fill out the team, Rel observed. How could you tell? Emblem on the sleeve. Not all teams have one but they did. The guy at the back didn't have one, so I think they might have roped him in to help with the dirty work. Sucks for us. Scylla sighed. That was the only team to leave that day. And as dusk fell Tyron bid farewell to his two new acquaintances, and made his way back to the inn, where he gladly filled his stomach, and exchanged gossip with the staff, before heading to his room to practice mana bolt, until he cast sleep on himself and passed out. Undaunted, he awoke the next day and checked his status, pleased to see he'd managed to raise the spell to level 3. Not bad for a non-class skill with only a few nights practice. His speed was improving along with his efficiency. How well would he do with a moving target? Hard to say, but at least the magic felt more comfortable than before. With a little luck, it might even be usable in a fight. Although he didn't rush over like he had the previous morning, he was still there before the bulk of the crowd which meant he was able to secure a similar location to the day before, and soon enough he welcomed both Rel and Scylla back with a smile and a wave. Nice hat, Rel observed. I think I got burned yesterday, Tyron admitted sheepishly. You are unusually pale for a rat, Scylla poked at his arm. You allergic to the sun or something? Just spent a lot of time indoors. I'm a bit of a night owl as well. The three chatted on and off as there continued to be little action throughout the morning, as the crowds continued to build. Just before lunch something finally happened when a team made their way out of the keep. As before, Tyron stood and tried to appear capable as all around the rats did the same. When the Slayers came into sight he could feel a rush of excitement from his right, as Scylla seemed to swell up on the spot, a grin plastered on her face, despite her efforts to hide it. Tyron was confused. But his questions were soon answered as the woman who led the team wandered a little closer. When she spotted the girl waiting. Scylla you useless lump. The slayer shook her head. Ready to go kill some riftkin. Hells yes. She cheered. I'll even help carry your shit. That's how gracious I am. Damn right you will. The woman replied. A hint of laughter in her eye. Come on then. Let's get to it. Filled with energy. Scylla grabbed her pack and practically leapt out onto the road to join the group. Tyron didn't have a chance to wish her good luck before she ran off down the road and through the gate, on her way to the broken lands. When the gate rattled shut behind them, he settled back down with a sigh. That's Marion's team, Rel told him. Same group she went out with the first time. Good group, good rep. Hopefully she'll be fine. I never asked what level she was, Tyron realized. Is she really strong enough to fight against the monsters? Rel grimaced. Look, it's kind of rude to ask people what level they are. And if you ask the people around here, they're going to lie to you 9 times out of 10. There's just no need to inform your competition. As to fighting the Riftkin, hell no, we aren't really expected to fight them. Offer support, chip in if there's an emergency, sure but not go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Usually the Slayers will let the rat fight a couple of weaker creatures as part of the payment, helps them get some experience, develop their skills and gain levels, which makes them more useful rats. Usually, well, you can negotiate your price a little with the teens. The more cash you want, the less they'll feel inclined to help you fight. 
you need to make a call as to whether you want money or to help develop your status. Doesn't that just mean you have to go without pay if you want to become a slayer? Pretty much. Ouch. The more I learn about it, the more I think this system sucks, he observed. The other man rolled his shoulders and sighed. There isn't a single person here who isn't desperate, Lucas. If you can't hack it, then you're better off somewhere else. Tyron just shrugged. I think I fit right in, Rel. I've got nowhere else to go. The two didn't say anything else for a long time. Instead, they settled in to wait. The rest of the day passed in much the same way as did the next. Tyron struggled with the wasted time, a sense of urgency growing inside him with each passing moment. He had to get out there. He had to improve. More than once he considered just slipping outside of the city and rushing into the broken lands by himself. But he knew deep down, he would more than likely die if he were to try. He was far too weak to chance it. The monsters of the rifts would tear him apart. He didn't even have minions to fight on his behalf. Without them he was worse than useless. No, he had to wait. Thankfully, the fourth day proved more promising than those that had gone before. Chapter 25 Tell me you aren't serious. Dove, you think I'd joke about this. By the sweet melons of Selene I wish it wasn't true. But unfortunately, the local marshals have requested my assistance for another week. A week? These fucking pricks. So what are we going to do? Sit on our ass around the keep for even longer. That's bullshit, Rogel. The team leader sat in a chair that groaned under his broad frame, his hands rubbed slow circles around his temples as the group bickered in the sitting room of their suite. Too much time spent cooling their heels wasn't good for the group. They'd lose their edge if they stayed here for much longer. Already people were getting on each other's nerves. They needed to vent. We're going to head out, he finally said after the others had finally gone quiet. Not for a full trip. He held up a hand to forestall the protest, ready to burst out of Dove. We'll do a four-day patrol. Work out the stress, pick up some coin and come back. By the time we get back, rest up for a couple days? Dove should be done with this nonsense. And we can gear up to head through the rift. Sound good? No, a real snorted. But it's better than hanging around here. Monica didn't look convinced. She massaged her forehead as she pondered their options. I don't know about this Roger we head out with only three we are going to be worse than shorthanded. We won't even have the summons to help out. I'm aware of that. We'll grab a rat or two on the way out to pick up the slack, and I specifically said a patrol. Did I not? If things get tense we can pull right out and return to town. I don't want to take unnecessary risks. Fine, the mage sighed. I just worry as all. Dove sulked, his knees pulled up to his chest as he sunk into his chair. This is fucked, he complained. I get dragged all over town to prod every piece of horse shit with a trace of magic in it. And you guys get to hunt Rifkin. If I ever find out who performed that ritual, I'm going to carve out their guts and eat their heart like an apple. Sounds like Duck Summoner talked to me, a real murmured. Oh, fuck off. We are sorry. Dove, Monica tried to soothe the testy summoner. We would all rather you were free and able to come with us. Who could have predicted the marshals would be this stubborn? The thin man sagged even further into his chair if it was possible. The tension draining out of him as he surrendered to his misery. It's getting worse and worse since they can't find any leads. There's no traces of whoever cast the stupid thing. We haven't found anyone with a class that might learn the spell. Or teach it. Or any motivation for the ritual in the first place. It's as if whoever's responsible did it just to stick a finger up at the marshals. And then went to ground. Doesn't that mean you might be free soon? Rogel asked hopefully. If they aren't getting any further in their investigation. As far as that prick, Langdon is concerned. Not finding anything just solidifies me as a suspect, even though he's literally seen my thrice cursed status. If he's seen that Aril said, he thinks I might have falsified it. Which obviously someone with access to evil magic fuckery would likely be able to do Dove said, sounding tired beyond belief. Rogel raised a brow. I've never heard of it being possible to fake a status ritual. Oh, it's possible, Dove told him. But it's more than a little illegal. And you need to be digging into some rather awful classes to be able to do it. When they find someone who can do it, they usually get palmed off to the Magisters. So they can make an example of them. It ain't pretty. How have I never heard of this? A real wondered. Dove laughed a little bitterly. This is usually mage business, a real, no offense. This is stuff we learn pretty early on. 
Silence hung in the air for a long moment as each of them dwelled on their thoughts, until Roger broke the spell by clapping his thick hands together. That's it, he spoke sharply, get your stuff together. I want to be out the door in one hour, no excuses. Anyone who doesn't meet the deadline is on latrines for the whole trip. Dove, you might as well get yourself down to the barracks and report for duty. The only thing you can do to clear your name is keep showing up and proving them wrong. If they try to move on you without evidence, I'll bring the whole keep down on their damn heads. Me first, Dove smiled with far too many teeth. In short order the team was packed and ready to go. Sans Dove who had sulked his way out the door under escort for his safety. In a foul mood but pleased to be out of the keep, Rogel and the other members filed their paperwork and set out. The broken lands awaited. Team. The guard on the keep gate asked as they approached. Rogel palmed his face in irritation. Travis, I've walked through here with my team a hundred times. Do you really need me to say it? The old man with the pinched face just squinted at him. Regulations are regulations, as well you know. You have to identify yourselves so I can sign you out. Team. Hammerblow. Wasn't so hard was it? Take it easy out there Rogel. Been more activity than normal. No shit. With a jerk of his head Rogel directed Monica and a reel forward. If you were going to be so hung up about it. You should never have let Dove have a say in naming the group, Monica admonished him. I still think Melon Smashes was the best choice, Iril drawled. We would have got it over the line, if you hadn't burned your veto on it. If I was going to have to be part of a group called the Melon Smashes, I won't have just left, started a new team, and then recruited you all into it, leaving Dove behind, Roger growled. Now keep your eyes peeled for a rat. And let's get the hell out of this town. I need to kill something. The moment the three slayers stepped out of the keep they were mobbed on both sides by urchins and thugs, each with the stench of desperation hanging over them. Monica's lip cold as she beheld the unwashed masses. She might be used to coming home reeking like shit, but she was less used to heading out that way. Move aside, Roger growled as a few too many hopefuls drew close. And thankfully they listened. Technically they weren't allowed to cut people down in the streets, but it was also illegal to obstruct her slayer in the course of their duty, which Team Hammerblow, having filed their paperwork, were now officially doing. Roger kept his eyes forward, not looking left or right, as he marched purposefully toward the gate, and Aril had her head in the clouds, which meant the responsibility for finding help would fall onto Monica's shoulders, as usual. She frowned and bit back her temper as she tried to find someone in the crowd she could live with. But as she scanned the dozens upon dozens of faces, she found no one who appealed to her. It wasn't a good idea to be picky when hiring a rat. But if she could find someone who at the very least wasn't dirty, that would be a win. As they rounded the corner and the gate came in sight, she still hadn't found someone. And she could tell from Roger's determined stride that he sure as hell wasn't going to stop. Monica bit her lip as she looked left and right, and the press of bodies and faces that lined the road all seemed to blend together into one sweaty mass of unwanted flesh. Out of time and annoyed she determined that she may as well throw a finger out, and pick someone at random and damn the consequences, if they proved useless. If the others weren't going to help then they could hardly blame her. Then she spotted a face, slight, clean, with tired, yet intelligent eyes. The young man stood with his hands clasped in front of him, and a small smile on his face. When he noticed her glance he nodded slowly and tried to stand a little straighter. He was so different from the regular crowd of farm boys and brawlers, that he instantly caught her eye even as she wondered how useful he might be. With a scrawny build like that, would he even be able to carry his weight? She stepped toward him. What's your name? She asked him directly. Ah, Lucas? Lucas Armsfield. You don't look much like a rat, Lucas. A runaway merchant's boy. I'd rather not hire someone if their family is going to hire idiots to attack my team in a futile act of vengeance, should you fall to the Rifkin. At the mention of family she could see him tense, there was a story there. My family are involved in the, uh, industry, he said, flicking his eyes up to the keep, and they encouraged me on this path. Nothing like what you describe would occur, I assure you. She half believed him, he sounded genuine. Do you have any relevant skills, or the requisite strength? We are only out on patrol, but this will be hard and dangerous work for you. 
I have a much tougher constitution than it might appear. I've learned the butchery skill here in town, and have my own set of knives for any work you might need done. I'm still new to it, but I spent time in a local shop to learn a few tricks. I'm also well accustomed to working with little sleep, and have spent a good amount of time camping in the wilds. I won't slow you down. He spoke with absolute confidence and a clear eye. She was warming to this lad. Can you protect yourself? She asked him. He raised a brow, and she nodded permission to his silent question. He paused for a moment, his face a mask of concentration, before he thrust a palm forward toward the road. A colorless streak of energy blasted from his hand before scattering over the stones. Monica assessed the spell critically. He cast it fast, and the projectile was close to invisible, as it should be. He had some skill. Terms? She asked him. His smile was filled with relief. Her question was an admission that he would be hired. No experience, only pay, he said. She raised a brow. Hard up for money. She was surprised. Most rats would cut their pay down to the bone, in order to demand a greater share of the kills, in order to help level their classes. I need money more than levels right now, he shrugged. Consider yourself hired. Let's go, she said, and turned to find her two teammates were already at the gate, waiting for it to open. With a soft growl she picked up her pace, trusting that the rat would follow along on her heels. He looks scrawny, Rogel said as she approached, looking over her shoulder. If you want a say in the help we hire, then you would need to open your mouth and participate, she said curtly. I think he has potential. By the time the gate was open, the hired help had caught up to them, his pack firmly tied on. Monica nodded to him encouragingly, and ushered him through the opening before following behind. Once they were all on the other side the gate creaked mightily as it swung shut with a dull boom. They were out. Despite everything Tyron couldn't deny the bubble of excitement welling up inside him the further they left the city behind. He'd heard about the rifts his entire life, his parents had made themselves famous for the many victories they'd won in places just like this. His uncle Worthy had done the same, earning enough coin that he could buy an inn and settle down with plenty left over. Even more than that, these were the places where people became strong where they could polish their skills and level their classes against the unending flow of monsters who flooded through the rifts. First time out to the rifts, the woman, Monica, asked him. Tyron tried not to blush. Is it that obvious? He said. A little, she laughed, not to worry. I can remember the feeling the first time I came out here. No matter how much you know, it's never quite enough to prepare you. She reached out and placed a hand on his shoulder. Don't worry. We're just skirting around the edges on this trip. It's an ideal situation for someone like you. A chance to fight some monsters, see the broken lands for yourself, without having to jump through a rift. A snort came from behind them. Tell me you aren't hitting on the rat moniker. He's 18 for goodness sake, the scout, Eril drawled. The mage narrowed her eyes and slowly withdrew her hand. I was trying to reassure him. Not all of us are so thirsty we see ulterior motives in every interaction. Both of you shut up, the leader growled, anger clear in his tone. Eyes out, no mistakes. That includes you kid. Time to work. Properly chastened, Tyron snapped his gaze to their surroundings as they continued to walk. An hour ago they'd left the town behind. And already the road was gone. Not left, but a wide dirt track that wound its way through the trees. He was reminded of his final desperate journey through the forest before he'd reached Woodsedge, when he'd fought Rifkin again and again, until his minions had fallen in his defense. Against even weaker monsters his two skeletons had proven to be unable to compete, against the true terrors of the rifts, he had no illusions as to how he would fare. The only reason he could travel in this area with any semblance of safety, was because of the company he was keeping. A tense silence descended on the four figures as they continued to follow the trail, each of them eyeing the woods with weapons drawn until Rogel brought up a hand. We'll break from the trail here and circle to the west. A rill, stealth up and range ahead, no more than 200 meters, all right? We're short-handed, so keep the formation tight. Got it. By the time Tyron had turned around, the scout was already gone, invisible to his eyes as she slipped away making use of her skills to slip between the trees, moving from shadow to shadow to hide. Palms a little sweaty, he brought a hand up and tried to focus on the mana bolt spell. Cautious, his eyes flitted between the trees, and he tried to find any sign of monsters, before they descended on him. Roger led the group away from the path, and they were soon deep between the trees, 
no sign that the worn trail had ever existed. With his broadsword in hand, he walked forward at a steady pace, Monica and Tyron stepping carefully in his wake. As if they crossed an invisible line, Tyron felt a ripple pass over him. Like a shiver, and he gasped out loud and looked around himself in wonder. Something didn't feel right, suddenly. He stretched out his hand in front of him, and it felt like it was kilometers away, instead of right in front of his face. When he drew it back the seconds dragged out until it felt like minutes had passed before it returned to his side. What is happening? He whispered. It's a rift, Monica answered, her voice low. The border between worlds is thin here. It can do strange things to your perception. Focus. They continued to advance, and gradually he grew used to the strange sensation. Time and distance just didn't feel as they should, they were bent or walked in some strange way. As he struggled to adapt, the trees became thinner around them, and things began to open up. Rotten logs, smashed branches, and huge gouges in the dirt became more common. Tyron saw a boulder, shattered into a thousand pieces wedged into the dirt as they stepped around it. One didn't need to be the son of the century slayer to realize that these were the remnants of battles between slayers and monsters. His heart began to pound in his chest, and he took deep breaths to stay calm. He could understand what Scylla had been saying now, that only a half of the rats would make it back. Despite knowing as much as he did, it was still disorienting and intimidating when you actually set foot here. Kid, get up here. He was snapped out of his meditative thoughts when Rogel called him. The team leader stood atop a small rise beside a broad oak tree, eyes forward as he waved Tyron forward with a hand. He glanced toward Monica, and she met his eyes and gave him a quick nod. Encouraged, he walked forward, his eyes tracking from flank to flank, as he watched for trouble. What is it? He asked quietly. Rogel pointed forward. Take a look, kid. Something you can't see anywhere else. Drink in the view of our shattered world. Tyron frowned and turned to follow the line of the Slayer's arm, and gasped. He knew about it. How could he not? He'd read about these places, listened to every story that his parents had to tell with rapt attention. Despite that, he was still shocked by what he saw. Over the rise the world was wounded. The trees grew thinner until there were none, and what remained was a tortured and cracked landscape that pulsed with strange energies. That faded in and out of view in a mind-bending display. Overhead the sky roiled and twisted, a permanent storm that wrapped around itself like a den of snakes. Worse still were the fleeting glimpses of alien landscapes that overlay the land in front of him. That stung his eyes, and he felt a headache form the longer he looked. Then there were the monsters. The Riftkin crept over the land or railed within their doomed worlds as they sought a way to cross over. So many Tyron whispered. Roger grinned. Means we're never out of work. Welcome to the broken lands, kid. Try not to die here. Chapter 26. Roger bellowed, his war cry little more than a guttural roar that rattled the leaves overhead as he brought his greatsword down in a mighty slash. The monster squealed before him, its rage and desperation palpable in the air, but he didn't hesitate. He'd seen too many hesitate, they didn't usually get a second chance. Crunch. The sword, over a hundred kilograms of enchanted steel, shattered the monster's defenses, and cut deep into the flesh beneath. With a final, rattled hiss the Riftkin breathed its last and collapsed in a heap. Undeterred, he drew back his sword and drove it forward deep into the body of the creature. When it didn't react he withdrew the weapon, satisfied that it was indeed dead. Tyron tried not to click his tongue. He understood not wanting to let the creature play dead and jump you from behind. Obviously it was better to be safe than sorry, but it was rather difficult for him to extract anything valuable from the remains. If they were so heavily mutilated, he prepared another bolt and held it ready in case it was needed. But as he swept his eyes around, it appeared as if nothing remained alive to fight. Talk, Roger barked, his tension still high. Clear, Monica replied. Clear, a rill called from amongst the trees. Any injuries? Monica asked. Got a scratch, a rill replied, still hidden. Come and get it checked then. You know not to take any chances with these creatures. I'll scout then, Roger nodded and turned to move into the woods. Ten minutes then we're on the move again. Get to work, kid. Tyron was already kneeling in front of the monster Rogel had slayed, his pointed carving knife in his hand. Looking over the body, he didn't think there would be much he could retrieve other than the core. The chitin was cracked all over, thanks to Rogel's rather brutal fighting style, and he likely couldn't separate any plates in ten minutes anyway. 
With a sigh he looked for the biggest gaps between the segments close to the center of mass, and began to carve. In two minutes he'd managed to find a great sized circular gem of pure white, that glowed with magic in his senses. Being careful not to touch it, he extracted the gem with the iron tweezers he purchased for this purpose, and dropped it into the bag tied to his waist. He had enough time to tackle a few more rivkin, so he surveyed the scene of the fight, and picked out the next largest monster. Size didn't always equate to power, but it did often enough that he'd found it was a safe bet to harvest the largest first, when he was pressed for time. As he worked, Monica sat with a rill inspecting a nasty gash on her arm. The scratch, he presumed. He watched out of the corner of his eye as the mage rummaged through her pack, and withdrew a needle, thread and ointment. It'll take a few days for this to patch up, she warned the scout, as she got to work cleaning and disinfecting the wound. You'll need to be careful to ensure you don't reopen the wound. A rill pulled a face. It's not going to scar, is it? She asked. No, I'm skilled enough to take care of that. Shame. Scars are hot. She caught Tyron's eye and winked salaciously. He tried not to blush and focused on his knife work, whilst Monica continued to patch the mouthy scout. She wasn't able to perform miracle healing like a priest or priestess would instantly curing the wound by drawing on the power of her divine patron. But she was surprisingly effective, considering she was only utilizing a subclass. Basically every team needed someone like that, a member with some capacity to cure injuries. Usually that would be someone with a healing main class, like medic, apothecary or doctor, and combat subs to keep them safe, or someone like Monica, who had a combat main, and had chosen a utility sub, in order to help her team. People capable of drawing on the power of the four, were exceptionally rare in Slayer circles, which was the reason Rufus was so desperate to get Elsbeth to follow him out of Foxbridge. Tyron stalled for a moment as he remembered his old crush. She'd always been so kind to him growing up, one of the few who were prepared to reach out to their son, despite his reclusive ways. He almost couldn't help falling for her. Then the awakening happened and all those childish concerns fell by the wayside. Still, he hoped what he told her was enough to cure her of any attachment to Rufus. She deserved better than being exploited by that bastard. And not having her to help him made Rufus's life that much harder when he tried to become a slayer, which was also a nice bonus. The core he was working on prized loose with a pop, and he placed it in the bag before shifting to the next monster. When the 10 minutes was up, he'd managed to collect 5 cores, and Monica had finished her stitching. A rill ran her hand lightly over the treated wound as she inspected the cut. Don't get sloppy, Monica warned her, we're a member down. We need to be careful even if we are only on the outskirts. I know that, the scout muttered. She looked as she might have more to say, but at that moment Roger strode back into the clearing. Let's move, there's more packs in the area, and I don't want to tangle with them. We need to retreat a couple of hundred meters. How many calls? The last he asked of Tyron without looking at him. Five. Not bad. Pick up the pace next time. Let's go. He'd gotten used to Roger's attitude by now. No matter how many he managed to grab, he would get the same answer. The group quickly picked themselves up and got moving. They made good time through the sparse woods that bordered the devastation of the true broken lands, as Roger ranged ahead, leading them around monsters he thought they couldn't fight, as he marked rifts that seemed more active than others, and steered them clear. Tyron had learned that this team usually had a summoner along as their fourth member, and without the powerful summons and utility that the class provided they were understandably reluctant to engage in anything more dangerous than picking off stray groups of Riftkin. For capable and mid-level fighters like these, it was a lot like swatting bugs, generally not worth their time, but he could definitely understand the caution. An hour later they finally came to a halt as the leader crept back to meet them. Any issue? Monica whispered when Roger drew close enough. He shook his head and waved them away from the rifts. The others sensed his caution and crept along behind a few hundred meters, until they felt more comfortable. What is it? The mage pressed him. There's a rift in there that doesn't look too stable. Roger pulled a face and ran a hand over his bald head as he stared into the distance, as if watching the rift through the trees. Too many rift kin there for us to get close enough to take a better look, but we should report it when we get back. Things have been a little hairy out here lately. I don't want to take a chance and have a break occur. 
No shit, Iril grunted. Tyron agreed. A break wasn't in anyone's best interest. Not only would a horde of Rifkin break through, the larger ones that normally couldn't pass into this world would appear, which could be devastating. This was the sort of thing his parents would be called in to fix, and they happily would, diving through the rift and slaughtering everything they found on the other side, except right now they were busy hunting him. The other consequence of a break was that it further eroded the wall between the worlds in that area, which meant more and stronger rifts would appear from that point on. Without a method to stabilize the broken lands, a break brought everyone closer to the day, when the Riftkin overpowered the Slayers, and wiped the world clean of life. For now, such a possibility was so distant that no one seriously considered it, but it was a reality of life nonetheless. Do we keep patrolling? Monica asked. Rogel nodded. Yes. But we'll have to avoid this side. We'll backtrack and switch our patrol path to the east side. How's the wound, Aril? It's fine. Give me a little while, and I'll be back to full mobility. She should avoid moving at her best for two days, Monica broke in, and Aril flashed her an irritated glare. She's doing her job, Roger comforted the scout and placed a steadying hand on her shoulder, relax and take your medicine. If you're going to be pissed about getting injured, then don't get hit in the first place. The mistake is on you. I know that, she grumped, slightly mollified. Tyron knew enough that his input wasn't required here. The grown-ups were talking. He was supposed to keep his mouth shut and look attentive. Which he did, until he shifted his foot and felt something sharp under his boot. He looked down and raised his leg to look and stared for a few long seconds, as he processed what he was looking at. Oh shit, he said as he hopped awkwardly to one side, nearly landing flat on his ass. What is it? Roger was there in a flash, eyes flicking from side to side as he drew his blade. Oh, nothing, nothing. Just didn't expect to see, uh, that under my foot he stammered a little as he gestured to where he'd been standing. The team leader glanced down at the grinning skull poking through the dirt, and sighed as he sheathed his weapon. You'll find plenty more of those out here, kid. He turned back to the others. Where were we? As they continued their conversation, Tyron took a deep breath to steady his nerves. He'd been shocked to see the empty sockets staring up at him, of course. But he was also surprised to find what he was looking for literally underfoot when they stopped. Without drawing attention from the others who continued to converse nearby, he reached into a pocket in his pack and withdrew a simple map he purchased in town. After a few moments of estimation, he marked their current location with a lead before he rolled the parchment and stowed them together with the pencil. He might not be able to get back here anytime soon, but that was one place he could find the remains he needed. There were sure to be hundreds more out here. Let's move, Roger said, standing straight once more as the others finished their discussion and began to jog back the way they'd come. Being careful not to fall behind, Tyron kept pace, his eyes watching the surrounding trees with care, but also, every now and again, he glanced down to the ground. There would be more. In Woodsedge, stillness and silence lay over the cemetery. A fine mist, the only presence that moved amongst the gravestones, caressing the worn engravings and fine moss that decorated those faces. Illuminated by the light of the waning moon, it was a peaceful scene, if a haunting one. My balls itch, Dove complained. Marshal Langdon stifled a sigh and tried to maintain his vigil. His partner seemed determined to ensure that such a thing was impossible. I think it's the moisture in the air, the mage said. It's soaking straight through my slacks. I suppose I should get better quality clothing. I usually don't bother since I'm usually either roughing it, or slumming about the keep, in which case I don't usually wear pants. You wouldn't be able to recommend a tailor, would you? The marshal took a deep, slow breath before he replied. I'm aware you find our work to be beneath you, Mr. Levin, but I'd prefer it if you were to stop talking. I am trying to focus on a stakeout. I'm trying to avoid getting some sort of fungal infection, which I think is of vastly greater importance than what we are doing here. How have you even been allowed to pull me into this crap anyway? What does this have to do with the abyssal summoning? Nothing. That's what. My team is out there in the broken lands, risking their lives and fighting and doing other cool shit, whilst I'm here worrying if my blessed testicles are going to rot. No, Marshal Langdon, I'm not going to stop talking. I'm going to bitch and moan until you either let me go, or explain what in the name of the hells I'm doing out here. 
I'm out here doing my job, Mr. Levin, watching the cemetery for signs that a necromancer has been at work. Or catch him in the act. You are here, I suspect, because everyone you have met since the night of the incident has found you to be an insufferable asshole and will go out of their way to make you suffer because they believe you deserve it. Your constant moaning and whining is like music to their ears and they will never grow tired of it. I did not ask for you to be here, nor do I want you here. Since you are, perhaps you can actually be useful and help me try and track a criminal instead of acting like a spoiled child. The two men sat in silence for an extended period as Dove contemplated the words of the marshal. There was some merit to what the man said, he had been acting like a prick over the last few days, annoying the officers, being less than useful when inspecting scenes, napping frequently, which no doubt led many of the marshals to delight in his suffering. On the other hand, remember when you guys arrested me without calls, locked me up and made me run around town looking for a culprit that you believed was me the entire time. I've cooperated in good faith as much as I possibly can, but you are yanking on my last chain. You know, just as well as I do, that this necromancer kid didn't do the summoning. There's no shot. No fucking shot. So why are we even out here? A level 1 necromancer is nothing. What the hell are we doing out here Langdon? The officer sighed and stood stretching his back as he did so. It was clear there was no point trying to remain hidden. So long as the summoner was going to run his mouth. Let me be candid with you, Mr. Levin. I don't think you are responsible for the summoning incident. But that matters little. Since my superiors are determined to piss you off for as long as they can. We've run out of leads trying to run down the person responsible. So I've been told to keep an eye out in case the necromancer. Who is most likely level 2 since we have witnesses to a successful cast of Ray's dead. Makes an appearance. He managed to cast it on his own. Dove whistled. Impressive. The marshal stared at him levelly for a long beat. No, Dove gasped, you haven't given up on that theory. You can't be serious. Raising the dead is tricky, I'll grant that. But busting through the veil, peering into the abyss, it's a totally different level. And you fucking know it. You don't know what his name is. How in the hell would that matter? Unless his father pisses magic and his mother's teats dripped arcane crystals, then I don't think it's relevant. Magnin and Beery steal him. Oh, shit. Dove stared at him. Shit, he repeated before he turned around and strode through the cemetery, his hands pressed to his temples. After a moment he came back, the shock still plain on his face. Fucking shitballs. He swore. I understand that you're surprised. Are you kidding me? This is a joke, right? The Steelham's kid is a rogue. A necromancer? That is mother's melons, that is shit. Marshal Langdon rolled his eyes as the summoner continued to splutter and curse. After five minutes or so, he finally ran out of steam. Well, first thing, if the kid is smart enough to raise the dead without any help, then he sure as hell isn't going to be caught rummaging around cemeteries. That's Beery's kid for fuck's sake. There's no reason not to be cautious. I suppose I see that. See if he trips himself up. And you know very well that whilst a level 1 necromancer isn't a threat, a level 41 is. A bit of an issue. Langdon raised a single brow. A lot of an issue. The mage conceded. I get that. But this is the child of two of the greatest heroes the western province has seen since ever. Those two have slain more Rifkin than anyone and held back the tide basically on their own for decades. Decades. Doesn't that mean anything? Are you suggesting we allow someone with a forbidden class to run free? Yes. Why the fuck not? If for no other reason than to keep those two on side, they deserve at least that much. The Magisters don't agree apparently. Those fucking ghouls. It's not enough that they need to burn their sadistic brand into us. They want the kid dead. For what? Who has he hurt? Huh? He did raise the dead from their rest, the Marshal replied sharply. Who gives a fuck? They're dead. I think the family would have a different view. Oh, I'm sure they're pissed. But does that mean the kid deserves to die? Langdon's expression hardened. He will pay the penalty for the crime of refusing to relinquish his forbidden class, as well you know. Those classes are forbidden by decree. And I'm sure I don't need to remind you why. Dove threw his hands in the air. It's bullshit and you know it. The Magisters look the other way all the damn time. It's illegal to have the thief class. So why the fuck are there so many thieves? 
Why do bandits still exist? Huh. Don't get me started on the shit the nobles are rumored to get up to with classes. The marshal paused. He couldn't argue with much of what the summoner had said. Stamping out illegal classes wasn't a huge priority. It was true. But even if he rightly pointed out a necromancer had infinitely more potential for harm than a thief, it wouldn't get through to the irate mage. Either way, it's not going to matter. He sighed, the kid isn't going to make it past the next few months. You're that confident, are you? Dove asked. I suppose it's just a single kid, you'll track him down eventually. Langdon hesitated to say the next part, but it was common knowledge. It was only a matter of time before Dove found out anyway. Not quite. The Magisters ordered some high-level slayers to track the boy down and bring him in. It's only a matter of time until they find him. Dove was silent for a moment as realization slowly crept up on him. Who was it? He said finally, his voice flat. Who did they send? The Marshal looked him in the eye. Magnin and Beery steal him. Dove stared at him, his face a mask of frozen rage, as his hands clenched into fists by his sides. Those sick fucks, his voice sounded strangled in his throat. Abruptly the summoner turned on his heel and stalked away. All of you can fuck off, he grated over his shoulder. Your office can either arrest me or burn in the pit for all I care. I'm going back to my team. Chapter 27 Tyron started awake and found the indistinct outline of a rule standing over him. Come on rodent, you're on watch. He blinked a few times as his thoughts slowly caught up with the situation. Right, he was on watch tonight so the others could rest. He nodded in the dark, and the scout patted him the shoulder before she moved away to find her own bedroll. He shook his head a little as he sat up trying to clear the fog in his head, before he pulled himself out of his blankets, and threw his cloak over his shoulders, before he strapped his sword back onto his waist. It wouldn't be much use in his hands against an actual monster, but it was better than nothing, and gave him a slight sense of security. With the fire still crackling, he walked to the edge of the light, and found a stump he could comfortably park himself on as a rill nestled down into her roll behind him. The three slayers had been pushing themselves hard over the past few days, and even with their superhuman endurance, they needed rest. If they were tired, Tyron was exhausted. Without his unusually high constitution for a person of his level, he would have likely passed out ages ago, and forced the others into pulling back. This level of fatigue was still something he could deal with, so he sat and wrapped his cloak around himself as he tried to keep watch for anything that might want to kill them. They'd pulled a long way back from the rifts before making this camp, in truth they were no longer within the broken lands at all, which gave him some sense of security. Even so, he'd been able to find Rift King kilometers away from here on the other side of Woodsedge, so there was bound to be many crawling through the area. He just had to hope they wouldn't find him before he could alert the others. The light of moon broke through the foliage above in patches, creating a shifting pattern of pale silver on the ground. That revealed the bark, leaves and rotting vegetation of the forest floor, in fleeting glimpses. Though he had the night owl feet, which helped him stay alert during the night, he had nothing to provide more vision in the dark which meant the shadows were almost impenetrable to him as he tried to stay alert. All in all it was an unnerving experience, and his pitiful collection of skills and spells didn't feel nearly as praiseworthy, when he had nothing but himself to rely on. Everything would be different if he had minions. He'd be able to fight, he'd have extra eyes to look out, he'd be able to safely, or at least more safely move through these woods to find the resources he needed. He glanced behind him to see a Rill was ensconced in her bedroll, hopefully already asleep before he pulled his map out of his cloak. Light, he whispered. He barely charged the spell, providing only enough energy to produce the faintest of lights. So weak he could barely see the ink on the paper, despite holding the globe a scant few centimeters away. Seven locations were now marked on the paper, ranging over the west and east sides of the rift. Finding remains had not been nearly as difficult as he'd feared. Just by sweeping his eyes over the ground, as they traveled he'd turned up more than enough bones he could return for. This was what he'd been aiming for all along, a source of materials that nobody would miss, or even realize were gone. It was the only way he could practice his craft and improve his status without anyone realizing what had taken place, which was the only way he could keep himself safe. What he hadn't expected was for there to be so many dead out here. Hacketh hadn't exaggerated when he talked about how many died out here in the Broken Lands. 
He didn't know if the bulk of the bones he'd seen belonged to slayers or rats. He supposed it didn't matter. Once the patrol was completed, he'd return to town and then have to find a way to get back out here safely to retrieve the remains he needed. The first would be the hardest. He'd be completely on his own after all. But once he had a single minion, it would be easier to get the second than the third. He estimated he probably couldn't support more than three right now, which might change when he reached Necromancer level 5 and achieved his first class feat. Something shifted in the dark and Tyron's breath caught in his throat as he froze, only thinking to extinguish his light a moment later. With the globe gone the only source of light became the fire behind his back and the moon high overhead. He readied a magic bolt and pushed a hand out, palm at the ready, should anything emerge from the darkness. For a few tense moments he waited, his eyes darting from side to side. But gradually, when no threat manifested itself, he relaxed his stance and lowered his hand. He waited a minute longer before he summoned the light again, a little brighter than the last time, and peered out into the shadows cast by the trees and fallen branches across the forest floor. With the globe hovering above his open palm, he swept his hand out, hoping to catch a glimpse of any riftkin, but met only disappointment when he saw nothing moving. Then he caught a glimpse of a jagged edge peeking out from under a log only a few paces away from where he stood. Tyron immediately felt a slight tingle crawl over his scalp, before he turned to check on his three companions rolled in their blankets behind him. To all appearances, they were sound asleep, though he moved closer to be sure before he returned and approached the log, stepping carefully to minimize any noise. As he drew nearer, he saw that he had in fact been correct in his earlier assessment. That broken edge that emerged from beneath the rotting wood was in fact a bone. What's more, a human bone, possibly a shin bone. Though he was still no expert when it came to a human skeleton. He would need to be an expert, he reflected to himself. A more thorough understanding of bones and how they were put together would be important information. He wouldn't always have access to human remains that were laid out neatly in a grave. In fact he'd basically given up on gaining access to exactly those burials when he decided to avoid cemeteries. No, he'd be piecing together his minions the hard way from this point forward. Would he be able to buy a medical text of some sort? It would be expensive, no doubt, but perhaps his pay from this excursion would be enough to cover it. Or would it be too suspicious for a young man, clearly not far past his awakening, to be purchasing a volume about the skeletal system? As he considered this question, he moved closer and dropped down to more closely inspect what he had found. It was definitely a human skeleton, though a damaged one. The bone he'd seen poking out from underneath the wood had actually been a forearm, snapped off somewhere near the wrist. Unfortunately, the hand was nowhere to be seen, but as he leaned in and peeked underneath, he found an almost complete set of remains, albeit with significant damage. No weapon was nearby, though there were signs of rotted leather armor amongst the leaf litter. Probably crushed by the tree as it fell during battle, he surmised which wasn't a great way to go. Not that there is a such a thing as a good way to go when fighting Rifkin. Dead is dead. Heart quickening. He paused to take a deep breath and sweep his light in a broad circle once more. He was still on watch after all and couldn't afford to be too distracted, yet with the chance to utilize his skills and progress his class sitting in front of him for the first time in over a week, he simply couldn't resist. In the back of his mind, the fact that he was locked into a race against time was a constant source of pressure and stress. Here was finally a chance to get some relief. In particular, there were two things that he really wanted to focus on, the two skills he'd been given, when he had received his class in the first place. Corpse appraisal and preparation. The two skills felt vague and undetermined in his mind. The fragments the Unseen had given him didn't have all that much to say. As he cast his eye across the bones, he felt he knew more about them than he otherwise should. The condition of the bones wasn't great, having been left in the open air and under the weather for goodness knows how long. The complete lack of flesh clinging to the remains had something to say for how long they'd been here or perhaps had more to do with the industriousness of vermin in the area, or perhaps the monsters, than anything else. Frowning, he tried to focus on his skills and what they were telling him, and found that other than slightly more detailed surface information, he wasn't getting much, which frustrated him endlessly. Surely this wasn't enough to improve the skill and level it up. Was it really the case that if he stared at enough bones and thought about them, he'd level it up? It just didn't seem right. 
He felt something was missing. He fell into contemplation for a moment he ran his eyes over the bones he could see. The yellowed brown shade glowing softly under the light he held over them. Necromancy was the process of magically animating the dead, be they zombie, skeleton or some other, more advanced variety. Did it really make sense that he would be expected to appraise and prepare corpses with this eyes and hands? Or was there a chance that magic was involved in these skills also? He hadn't been provided with the outline of a spell when he learned the skill. But there were many examples of techniques and methods that employed magic, yet weren't classified by the Unseen as spells. Perhaps this was one such application. Tyron crouched down and settled on his heels as he stared at the bones before him, searching inside his own mind in an attempt to stir those fragments of knowledge to guide his actions. How to reach out. How to utilize his magic to assess these remains. There had to be a way. He felt sure of it. The utilization of magic was a mix between an art and a science. This was one of the first things his mother had taught him. The energy that permeated the world came through the rifts, and could be drawn inside a person, forming their own pool or reserve of magic. And it was this that mages drew on to perform their feats. There were several ways to control magic. The words of power, discovered thousands of years ago, were a commonly accepted method. Tyron had no clue if the language had existed before the rifts opened, or if it had a name at that time. But over the centuries it had come to be known as mage speak, or just as the words of power. For more powerful spells that required precise control, complex weaving and a firm mind, the words were by far the best method of casting. The language itself, helping to shape and direct the arcane energy, reducing the burden placed on the mind. For smaller, simpler spellwork, gestures could be enough. His mother had told him of schools of magic that relied entirely on a lexicon of complex symbols and shapes performed in series with the hands. Supposedly the ambidextrous feat was a requirement for such practitioners if they weren't born with the gift or able to train themselves to do it. He himself utilized his hands in casting, though only in the simplified manner he had learned in his lessons. The final and perhaps most important aspect of casting was the ability to direct and focus the energy using the mind. One's own magic responded to thought, so long as they were backed by a strong enough will. With a powerful enough mind it was possible to perform even complex spells. But those required the high stats that came with a significant number of levels. Unsure how to proceed, he simply directed the magic within himself, and extended a tendril toward the bones. Under his focus control, the invisible thread of energy touched the edge of what he believed was a shin, and then dissipated. He frowned. Magic wouldn't just flow into a foreign object on its own. It had to be forced or infused. He knew that. He concentrated and tried again, using more magic this time he extended it toward the bone and held in there, pressed against the surface. It was a crude working, but he was feeling his way forward. As he held the arcane energy against the remains nothing happened. But he was patient, his focus razor sharp as he sensed for any change. A minute passed with no response. Then five, but still he persisted. He was no expert, but he knew that infusing magic into an object was a slow process, one that shouldn't be rushed. After ten minutes he finally saw a reward. An infinitesimal amount of his magic began to seep into the calcified bone, like water soaking into a rock. His eyes widened with excitement, and he leaned forward even if the process was invisible, only to frown again a few seconds later as something pushed back against the energy he provided. There was already magic inside the bones, only a bare trace of it. But it was potent. What's more, there was a strange feel to it, as if it were dark, or hungry, tainted in some way. Is this death magic? A rush of air and a snap just behind his head broke his concentration and brought him back to the present. Shit, he cursed as he sprang to his feet and flared the light in his hand. A small monster, no larger than knee-high was revealed. A bizarre creature of legs with too many joints and overlapping chitin plates. He concentrated, using his mind and simple gestures to shape the basic magic bolt before his thrust the palm of his open hand forward. The spell darted through the air before it struck the rift kin in the side, tearing a shallow gash through its shell and sending the creature tumbling to the side. Eager to follow up, Tyron stepped forward to keep the monster in his sight, another bolt prepared and ready to fling a few seconds later. But his attacker was swift and righted itself in moments, darting into the foliage and out of view. He cursed softly as his eyes darted across the brush, and the pounding of his heart filled his ears. 
Faint rustling sounds could be heard in the darkness, as the Rifkin skittered through the fallen leaves and branches. But he couldn't see a thing, even when he held the light above his head and flared it bright. He took slow, measured steps back toward the fire. If he couldn't deal with the creature himself then he'd best wake the Slayers. Such a weak creature might be a challenge for him. But it was trivial in their eyes. He planned to move slowly, so he could shake one of them awake. If he were to shout, during the night, who knows what he might call down on their heads. Best to be safe. Not for the first time he wished he had his minions. Perhaps he'd become too accustomed to his class in such a short time, but he didn't feel safe fighting without a skeleton to protect him. Not to mention he wouldn't advance his level without one, no matter how much fighting he did. A faint noise to his left drew his attention, and he turned his light-covered palm forward as his breath caught in his throat. There was nothing. This stupid critter was playing him like a fiddle. He grit his teeth and took another cautious step backward toward the low burning fire behind him. A few more in Monica would be within his reach. Then he had a thought. Perhaps there was a way for him to win. He hadn't tried the new spell he'd earned from the Anathema class. He hadn't even studied it due to his vague distaste for the premise of it. But it might prove to be just what he needed in this situation. He might not be able to see the Rift Kin. But that didn't mean that he wouldn't be able to strike at its mind. He reached internally for the fragments of knowledge he'd been granted, and began to pull them together into a coherent framework. Compared to Pierce the Veil or even Ray's Dead, this spell was child's play. But even so, it was risky to attempt a spell for the first time in a combat situation. He could still reach behind him and awaken a slayer, leave the situation in their hands. But somehow he didn't want to. If he could deal with it himself, then he could return to his study of the bones for the rest of his watch. He stared out into the forest as he worked to arrange his thoughts on Supra's mind. After a few long seconds he felt he was ready to make an attempt. It wasn't a long cast, but the spellwork was intricate, forming a conduit between himself and the target creature, through which the spell would attack their consciousness directly. He held the light high and used his free hand to form the gestures he needed, as he whispered the vocal component, and directed his magic with his thoughts. Once completed, he held the spell at the ready, hoping that it would work as he hoped. That sound again, from the right this time. He spun quickly to see the monster rushing at him from under the brush just before it leapt at him. He threw himself forwards, turned to his left, and flung the readied spell at the monster. Immediately he felt it connect and something strange happened. The spell encountered the crude awareness of the monster, and a war began as it tried to fight back, and he fought to press the spell down, and crush the monster's thoughts. The physical form of the Riftkin thrashed and writhed as he drove the spell home, before he finally felt its resistance break, and the monster grew still. Tyron's mouth twisted with distaste. The sensation of breaking the creature's mind with his own wasn't pleasant. But for now it was unable to move or resist in any way. He drew his sword slowly and stepped forward, ending the monster's life with a quick thrust through the head. He breathed out heavily. Only a small, weak creature. And it had given him this much trouble. He needed minions, higher quality ones, urgently. He checked the fire to see the three slumbering forms hadn't moved since the fight had started. Letting out a small sigh. He walked to his pack and quietly pulled out his butchering knives. He might as well see if this thing had a core. Chapter 28 Wake up you lazy sacks of bones. Time to get moving. Rogel emphasized his words with a few targeted shoves with the side of his boot. Not enough to cause any harm, but enough to get his team moving. When he reached the rat's sleeping roll, he was pleased to see the young man already awake and lacing up his coat. That's how the young ones should be, especially if they wanted to make the jump from an untrained nobody to a qualified slayer. When the kid looked up at him he met his eye and gave him an approving nod, before he stepped to his own things, and started to pack them away with sharp, efficient movements. The boy Lucas, was his name wasn't it? He'd held up surprisingly well over the last few days, maintaining a respectable level of performance, despite the long days and short nights. By now most rats would be out on their feet, more asleep than awake and delaying the team. Even a lot of newly graduated Iron Rank Slayers, would be struggling at this point, so the team leader had nothing bad to say about his fortitude. His knife work may have been sloppy, but it was better than most, those few levels and basic training in butchery. Saved a lot of time cutting out cores, and they'd built up a reasonable, if small collection of high quality chitin, that the armory could make use of in the keep. 
what had been a short trip to keep his team on edge and blow off steam, had turned into a nice little earner. Their rat had paid for himself multiple times over. Even better, they hadn't had to baby him through fighting monsters. Rogel was more than happy to part with extra coin, if it meant that he didn't have to waste time helping some kid flail away at a dismembered Rifkin. It lacked dignity. Today was the final day of their planned patrol, and he was determined to bring his friends and comrades back home safely. Almost all the worst incidents tended to happen towards the end of an expedition. People got tired, then they got sloppy. Rogel refused to allow himself to get sloppy. Arl, finish your pack and get out there in one minute. I want eyes in the trees. I'll carry your gear. The scout gave him a quick nod as her hands flitted about her roll, securing ties, and checking pockets faster than his eyes could follow. Monica, check your supplies and give me an inventory. If we're short on anything I want to know. Leader, the mage confirmed as she began to carefully check her medical bag, eyeballing each pouch, container and vial against the list she pulled from her waist pouch. Rat, you're with me. Once you've got your gear sorted we'll be standing guard until Monica is done. Got it. Leader, came the reply, and before long the kid was up and standing over the more experienced mage, spell ready in one hand and eyes scanning the woods for threats. Where did this kid come from? Roger wondered. He's way too good for a first timer. I guess Monica got lucky when she pulled him out of the crowd. It only took Monica a few minutes to finish running through her supplies, and report there was no meaningful shortage of any supplies. With that done, the team left the campsite and set off on their last patrol. We'll be keeping to the east side of the Broken Lands today as well. The west is still looking a bit too dicey for my liking. We'll move close enough to have a good look at the rifts before we backtrack and cover ground further out. Once midday comes, we'll start the trip back to Woodsedge. Anyone not clear on the plan? Everyone voiced their understanding, and Rogel grunted before he marched off into the woods, and the others fell into line behind him, Arrol still stalking through the trees. It took a little over an hour for the group to reach the edge of the broken lands, and another ten minutes to get close enough to get a clear view of the rifts. As expected, the activity of the Riftkin had increased despite the work of the teams in the field. Rogel spent some time taking notes as he peered out over the shattered landscape and blurred horizon, before he turned back, and ordered the group to return the way they came. They ran into several packs of monsters in short succession on their way out which tested their skills, and had Lucas sweating as he was interrupted multiple times, whilst trying to extract cores. Shortly after they ran into another team and briefly exchanged words before the two groups continued on their separate ways. An hour after Aral emerged from behind a tree next to Lucas and called out, Leader, I've spotted something you probably want to see. Trouble. Depends on your definition. No bullshit in the field, Aral, he snapped. Check for yourself. She pointed up, and Roger followed the direction of her finger to find a strange blue bird staring down at them. The color of the plumage was far from the last unusual feature of the creature. It possessed three eyes, each of them red as a ruby, and the light shimmered around it giving it an ethereal quality. That made it seem as if it wasn't of this world. Which of course, it wasn't. Wow, is that an astral? The rat wondered aloud as he stared up at the obviously magical entity watching them from above. Eyes on the woods. Rogel ordered before he leaned to the side and spat on the ground. Stupid bastard couldn't wait half a day for us to get back. Typical. He thought for a moment. Get some rest. We'll rest here for ten. I'll keep watch. I doubt he's far away if Farron is watching us. Okay, Monica replied, and Aaron nodded. Tyron looked confused as he glanced from the bird to the group and back again. It's our fourth member, Monica took pity on him, and let him know with a smile. He's a summoner, and Farron is the bird's name. He was caught up investigating the ritual that happened in town a while back, and couldn't come out with us. That's why we're only doing a patrol, rather than tackling the rifts head on. Since he's here, I assume that his work in town is done. For whatever reason the team's rat looked a little embarrassed at her words, and she moved to comfort him, placing a hand on his shoulder. Don't worry about it. To be honest, Dove's a bit of a pain anyway. It's been nice to be out in the field without him. You know I can hear you through the bird, right? A man's voice echoed out from the creature above. Of course, Monica looked up to smile pleasantly at the summon. Just checking. The mage turned her attention back to Tyron. It's been wonderful to get out and stretch our legs. Rogel thinks it's bad luck for a team to spend too long away from the field. Tyron nodded. 
Yes, I've heard the same thing from experienced people. That slayers who are out of action are toothless tigers. I've never heard it described that way, Monica chuckled, but I do agree. This isn't the kind of work where you can afford to be even a little short. It only takes one mistake to get yourself killed. And then there's one less person working to contain the rifts. You take this work very seriously, don't you Ms. Monica? Oh, please, just call me Monica. She smiled, and of course I do. We are trying to save the world. You can take your hand off his shoulder now. That strange disembodied voice rang out again from above. Shut. Ah. Uh. Dove, the mage ground out. Hey, it's not a crime, but I've heard some say it should be. Young people only recently come into their class are susceptible, vulnerable even, to wily older people with designs on their innocence. The youth need our guidance and protection, Monica, not a Ludash. The mage flung a hand out, and Farron, the unfortunate summon was immediately engulfed in flames that somehow left the branches and leaves completely unscathed even though Tyron could feel the heat from where he was standing. Stupid fucker, Monica ground out before she gave his shoulder a final squeeze and stepped away. Don't worry about Farron. He's back in the astral, and Dove can summon him again in a day or so. Ah right, Tyron replied. Behind them Aral had buried her face in her hands, her shoulders shaking from the effort of trying to contain her laughter. The group sat and didn't converse much until five minutes later they heard a loud rustling, followed by an irate-looking man in mage robes who stomped into view. Monica? You fucking cow ache. Would you burn my precious boy Farron is a treasure. He might be a treasure, but it's a shame he's attached to someone as vulgar as you, Dove. Vulgar. The man gaped. From you you were practically molesting that poor boy. I'll burn you. Dove, don't think I won't. You know she's not joking. Dove, Roger declared as he strode back into the clearing. And if I ever have to rub ointment on your backside again, because you couldn't keep your mouth shut, I'll thrash you myself. The new mage, Dove, held his hands up to the sky for a brief moment as if to say, Why me? Before the four slayers stepped towards each other and shook hands, clapped shoulders and welcomed back their errant member, while Tyron stood awkwardly to one side. I can't believe they let you go, Roger chuckled as he roughly shook Dove by the shoulder. I thought you'd be in irons receiving heinous torture by the time we got back, and we'd have to mount a daring rescue to bust you loose. It nearly came to that I think. I was told that some of the marshals were less than pleased by my company, and intended to make life difficult for me. Can you imagine? Oh, I think I can, Monica chuckled. Her earlier ire evaporated. Welcome back, Dove. Good to be back. Aral got injured while I was out. What the hell have you been doing out here, woman? Don't tell me you've also been distracted by the young meat. I prefer mine a little more seasoned. Old and wrinkly more like, the mage cackled. But I shouldn't be rude. Dove brushed past his comrades and approached Tyron, his eyes sweeping up and down the youth in one swift motion. A right-hander I see. Put her there. He extended a hand for the rat to shake. Ah, how did you know? Tyron frowned as the older. Skinny mage pumped his hand with far too much vigor. Then realization hit. My scabbard, obviously. Unusual to keep your blade where you're forced to draw with your weaker hand, Dove chuckled. I don't remember you being so observant, Dove, Aral drawled. You pick up a few things hanging around law enforcement, my dear friend, he turned back to Tyron. As you've no doubt heard, I'm Dove, a summoner and the fourth to this point sadly missing member of the team. Welcome aboard, young. Lucas. Lucas. I'm a little surprised to see they picked you up. We don't usually pick up rats for the trip. They tend to not make it back from the places we usually go. This one might well just Roger walked up and complimented the young man. He's been surprisingly competent. Handy with a spell and a few levels in butchery to boot. Really. Not many are willing to spend a point on a skill they see as beneath a real slayer. Dove nodded, impressed. Not many classes synergize with it either. That's a bold choice you made, kid. Ah, thanks. Tyron smiled, unsure how to respond to this rare praise from the team leader. Dove looked the young man in the eye for a short moment before he turned back to the others. Well, now that I'm back, how about we go and kick some monster butt and let off some steam? Who fancies a trip into the rifts? We can kill something big, get a fattest core and come home rich and happy. Roger smiled but shook his head slowly. No can do, and you know it. We only took supplies for a few days. And you sure as hell know. 
I won't poke my nose through a rift without a full scouting report and proper preparation. I'm sure you're pissed off and frustrated, but that doesn't mean we get careless and take risks. I want you pissed off and alive rather than satisfied and dead. Got it. You are a rigid stick all the way up my ass, leader. I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. Come on then, Roger threw an arm over his friend's shoulder. Let's head on back, get pissed, and then we can start arranging our next sortie. Something with a little more meat on the bones. I've had enough cleaning up the small fry, that's iron rank work. With a little more cajoling, Roger managed to get his team focused. And on their way back to town, though now Tyron definitely felt like a third wheel, as the others slotted so seamlessly together, that there was essentially nothing for him to do or a gap for him to slide into the conversation as the others bickered with the easy fluidity of very old friends. This didn't bother him too much, he was eager to return to Woodsedge and begin planning his own trip back out into these woods. A far more dangerous venture where he would attempt to recover whole skeletons from the sites he'd marked on his map while dodging Riftkin. You'd never believe the shit I heard in town, Dove was saying to the others as they walked their eyes constantly scanning the forest around them. Apparently there's a necromancer on the loose in the western region. Really? Monica replied skeptically. I think I heard about them in Academy. Isn't that class exceedingly rare? Yep, but it can cause such a shit storm that people tend to remember it. The change in topic was so sudden that Tyron nearly tripped over himself, caught completely unawares by the now dangerous conversation. They have no reason to suspect me. He reassured himself, just stay calm. I might even learn something. What makes it so dangerous? Aral asked, not really paying attention. At the lower levels it's shit, Dove replied basic undead. The kind you can find in any place with too many dead and too much magic. If it gets leveled though, the number and type of dead that they can support starts to rocket up. According to what I know anyway. How do you know so much about it? And isn't this basically what you do? Bring in minions to do your dirty work? Monica asked. First of all, most minion base classes learn about necromancers at some point. It's a notorious class. And second, no, this isn't remotely like what I can do. I can summon three entities, tops, and each of them is going to be better than a fucking zombie. But it's possible to control literally thousands of zombies at a time. They can rip through villages and population centers single-handed and never show their face. When they get strong enough, they can raise the remains at close to the strength they had when they were alive. But that's only at the tippy-top level of necromancer. Sounds ridiculous. How many times has something like that actually happened? Once in the last 200 years. Once. Once was enough, apparently. The class was blacklisted even before that happened. But they fucking hate necromancers now. Tyron kept his head down and tried not to look too much like he was listening. But he was focused on every word the skinny summoner said. So what? Some illegal went rogue. And now they're going to hunt them down. Happens every year. Doesn't matter what the class is. Oh. Oh. But this is where it gets juicy. Do you know who that kid is? Tyron fucking steal him. Who? No. Wait. You aren't serious. Oh, I am very serious. That's fucked up. The Steelum's kid. Illegal. Aral seemed particularly angry upon hearing the news, and Tyron carefully watched his step as his heart pounded in his chest. In a way, he wished Dove would stop talking, but also desperately wanted to hear, to learn whatever he could about his class, about his family. He fought to keep his breathing steady, and his expression bland as he continued to walk in silence. You think that's bad? Wait till I give you the kicker. The Magisters took this threat quite seriously. So seriously, they put their highest rank slayers on the task of hunting him down. That's bullshit. Aral exploded. Are you fucking serious? They want them to hunt down their own kid. They'll do more than that. They'll force them to it with the brand. That's horrific, Monica gasped. At this point I marched out of Woodsedge, gave the marshals the finger and caught up with you guys. I knew the Magisters were sick fuckers. Don't get me wrong, but this takes the fucking cake. The whole cake as well, sprinkles and frosting included. I was literally boiling with rage. I had to stick my balls in a barrel of cold water just to cool down. Dove, this is serious shit. Can we please not bring your balls into it? Why do your balls always have to be mentioned? Monica complained. Just because they have too much hair on them for your tastes, doesn't mean they don't have value to others. Shut up. 
I think a lot of people aren't going to be happy about this, Roger observed quietly. What do you mean? Aral asked him. The team leader sighed heavily before he replied. Think about it. The Steelums are heroes. The Slayers in this province worship the ground they walk on and hate the Magisters with a passion. There's going to be a lot of pissed off powerful people when word of this gets around. Oh, I'm telling everyone I fucking see. Dove assured him. Tensions are already high. The rifts are playing up more and more. Taking the two best killers off the table and have them trying to hunt their own child at this time is idiotic at best. And self-sabotage at worst. I don't see this ending well. Silence descended over the group as they continued to walk, and Tyron was happy for it as his mind whirled with what he had just learned. There were so many implications to this information he couldn't hope to process it in one go. He needed to sit. He needed to think. After ten minutes of quiet, Dove finally spoke up again. Well, the marshals are getting serious about looking for him since he hasn't shown up yet. When I left they'd started demanding a status reading of everyone going in and out of Woodsedge. The others in the team cursed, irritated by the delay caused by this bureaucratic nonsense. But Tyron stopped walking in for a beat, standing stock still. Status readings. He couldn't go back into town at all. He stood frozen for a long moment before he realized what he was doing. Was immensely suspicious and started walking again, flicking his eyes up to see if anyone had noticed his lapse. To his horror, he found the summoner staring back at him with wide open eyes. Dove nodded slowly to himself before he turned forwards again alongside his comrades. The group continued in silence until the walls of the keep came into sight, peeking through the foliage as Tyron thought desperately for an excuse to separate himself from the group. If he just ran, he'd look suspicious as hell. He needed a reason, but the harder he thought, the less plausible anything sounded to him, and the more panicked he became. At that moment Dove stopped and spoke to the others. You guys go ahead. I want to have a quick word with the kid before we get to town. Chapter 29 Tyron froze under the cool stare of the mage, and the others turned to him with differing levels of confusion on their faces. Monica went to say something, but Roger cut in first. Keep it short. We'll wait for you inside the gate. No need for that, Dove smiled. I'll catch up with you guys at the keep tonight. I've got a little business with a few ladies in town. If you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? Aril rolled her eyes. Yes. Dove, we know what you mean. The summoner looked around the group with a smirk on his face. I mean sex, he clarified. Shut up, Dove. Monica threw her hands up and turned to walk toward the gate. Just don't do anything weird to Lucas. He's been very helpful. Nobody's worried about me doing anything weird to the kid Monica. You're insufferable, she declared without turning around as she continued to stalk towards the gate. Dove chuckled and caught Tyron's eye before giving him a wink. By something weird, I mean sex, he said and nodded solemnly. Roger fished around in his pack for a moment before he approached his young hireling and held out his hand a small stack of silver in his palm. Pay for the trip with a nice bonus thrown in. We don't usually hire rats, but if you're available... We might consider you for another trip. You won't complete garbage. High praise, a real drawled, then reflected for a second. Actually, from Rogel. That is high praise. Yes. 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 All very nice. Now will you lot piss off? I have some important words to share with this young man. Rogel reached out and shook Tyron's hand. Don't let him talk you into doing anything illegal. He said seriously before he clapped him on the shoulder, causing Tyron to stagger and then walked away. See you around kid, a rill waved before she too turned and headed for the gate. In no time at all, the two of them stood alone, the summoner and the necromancer. Dove looked calm, a slight smile on his face, as he kept his gaze lazily focused on the youth, whereas Tyron was a nervous, sweating wreck. He battled to keep his hands from shaking and the nausea from overwhelming him, but a deep-rooted sense of despair had taken hold of him. This was it. He'd already failed. His parents had suffered for nothing. He'd escaped for nothing. He wouldn't get even a chance to explore his own potential to help people, to make his name heard. His world was crashing down around him, and all he could do was stand and stare. Dove held up his hands. Just relax, kid. Nothing's been decided yet. Okay. He was so overwhelmed, it took Tyron several long seconds to process what he'd heard. W what? Dove continued to stand in place, his hands held loosely up by his shoulders. I'm saying that it isn't all over for you, so there's no need to get emotional on me. 
I don't do well with that. I'm not going to kill you, and I'm not going to hand you over to the marshals right now, okay? Why would you hand me over to the marshals? Tyron felt compelled to try, but his heart wasn't in it. Dove looked at him with pity. That's a sad attempt, kid. I mean, I've seen some sad shit, Monica's love life, for example, but holy hell, that takes the cake. Fine, Tyron growled. I'm the necromancer. I'm Beery, and Magnan's son, Tyron. Is that what you wanted to hear? The summoner rolled his eyes and hung his head. Now that's just dumb. What if I was bluffing? Huh? You just spilled every bean in the tin. Tyron stared at him. You weren't bluffing, he said. No. No, I wasn't. But I fucking could have been. Silence fell between the two figures. They stood almost 10 meters apart and for a brief moment Tyron considered running. The mage was older, though not visibly stronger. Dove appeared to be a thinnish man in his 30s, without much in the way of muscle definition, showing through his loose mage robes. How fast could he be? Except it didn't matter how fast he was, it only mattered how quick his summons were. Without any minions, there was no hope for him to fight back against the contracted creatures that could be put on his trail in moments. Eventually Dove sighed and rubbed a hand through his thin blonde hair. Look, I don't usually deal with this kind of thing. I'm a fairly straightforward person. See Riftkin. Kill Riftkin. Get paid. Repeat from the top. I get to live comfortably, raise my level, polish my skills, and get all of my homicidal urges out in a nice, legal manner. He crouched down. Now, the reason I spoke about your situation with the others was twofold. I wanted to see how you would react, and I wanted to let you see how they responded. What do you mean? Tyron asked cautiously. Did you see how pissed off they were? How unsatisfied? The truth is, the people might worship slayers like fucking gods, but we are slaves to the magisters, each and every one of us. And we hate it. You know about the brand. A little. Then you know it's a bitch. I'm only silver rank, and it's already a piece of shit. Point is, most slayers aren't happy with the management, and that's putting it lightly. As for me, I fucking hate them with every bone in my body. That's the main reason I'm not going to turn you in. Tyron's mind spun. From the depths of despair, hope was once again kindled in his chest. But he just couldn't trust that it was real. Was this wiry mage telling the truth? Was he really just going to walk away after being caught? It seemed like madness, the direct opposite of everything he'd expected to happen. Dove watched the young man try to think through the situation, and gave him some time to process. He could remember himself at that age, just a few weeks after receiving his class, basically a newborn. He'd been one of the lucky ones, with a powerful starting class and the resources to put himself straight into a reputable Slayer Academy. Trying to imagine himself in the kid's shoes was painful due to just how easy it was. A summoner and a necromancer weren't that different fundamentally, except that one had been outlawed by the agents of the Five Divines, and the other hadn't. The practice of necromancy wasn't inherently evil. Shit, being able to put the dead to good use might be just the thing they needed to help fight the rifts. If the magisters got out of the way, maybe the slayers would be winning the war rather than slowly and painfully losing it. What's the catch? Tyron eventually asked, his eyes steady. Dove hid his smile. This kid reminded him too much of himself. Good head on his shoulders, liked to think his way through problems and was up front when he didn't have the answers. He spread his hands. No catch. I don't want anything from you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything for me, other than keep my name out of it, if you happen to get caught. In fact, the opposite is fucking true. I'm going to help you. I warned you about the status check on the gate, didn't I? Isn't that a tad helpful? That could be a lie. Dove snorted. That's the easiest thing in the world for you to confirm. Just watch me go through the gate and you'll have all the confirmation you need. You're locked out of town for the time being, kid, which means you're going to need some assistance if you want to survive. Without elaborating, the mage stepped back and brought his hands together in front of his chest before he inhaled slowly, then snapped his eyes wide open as they flashed with magic. Sonorous words of power rolled from Dove's mouth as his hands flowed from one movement to another with the ease of a true practitioner. Trying could recognize a few phrases here and there, but the bulk of the spell construction wasn't familiar to him, exposing how little he knew of dimensional magic, 
which was the heart of summoning. In a relatively short time, just over a minute, Dove completed his spell and thrust his hands down to the ground in front of him. A portal took shape in seconds, a swirling vortex of blue energy that connected this world to another realm, and from it rose a huge clawed paw that smashed into the dirt before it flexed enormous muscles bunching as the creature pulled itself through. Tyron's heart was hammering in his chest as a massive wolf head appeared, followed by the rest of its body. Easily the size of a horse, this creature would be able to rip him to shreds in seconds, no matter what he tried. A star wolf, he murmured. You recognize it. Dove sounded pleased as he raised a hand and ran it through the beast's fur. Was an absolute fucking nightmare trying to contract this bastard. But I managed it in the end. Currently my best and strongest summon for combat. He's going to follow you around for the next two days. The young man stared at the intimidating creature for a long moment. You want it to protect me? Bingo. Two days should be enough for you to get some minions ready to go. Enough to protect yourself at least. I'll meet you back here then. Make sure you hide the fucking zombies. Obviously. And I'll hit you up with some supplies to keep you going. I'm doing a lot for you here. Kid. So don't go psycho and burn down the kingdom or whatever, alright. Do some good, help some people, level up, piss off the magisters, it's all good. Try not to die and do your folks proud. Dove threw out a quick thumbs up. Now fuck off, I wasn't joking about that brothel. He moved to turn around and then froze and turned back. One other thing, I don't want to know how, or why, or any of that shit. I just want to know. Was it you who cast the ritual in town? The abyssal summoning. There was a short pause before Tyron nodded. Dove stared at him for a moment. Fucking hell, he swore and turned around, shaking his head as he went. That's just fucking great. Tyron watched him go, scarce believing he was safe, then turned to look at the wolf, who stared back at him with barely concealed impatience and a hint of hunger. If it was going to eat him, there was absolutely nothing he could do about it. So he disregarded the creature and tailed the summoner from a distance, confirming for himself the ritual he was required to perform just inside the gate. It was a massive blow. Perhaps the measure would be lifted in a week. It would be difficult for him to survive outside the walls much longer than that even with the support of someone inside. This wasn't just any wild country. He was on the edges of the broken lands. There were monsters everywhere. The star wolf had padded along behind him and now sat on its haunches its tongue hanging as it breathed, that same contempt in its eyes. He would have to depend on it for the next two days, as long as Dove kept his word, then the creature would protect him, until he had the ability to protect himself. He was tired, sore, hungry and in desperate need of a bath, but he wouldn't be getting rest anytime soon. He stood with a sigh, there wasn't any point complaining about it. His parents had suffered through far worse on their rise. Determined, he turned and began to stride back toward the rift. He had a variety of locations marked where he could find remains. He'd originally planned on coming back out to retrieve them anyway. This just pushed his timetable forward. Come on then, Tyron. He muttered to himself, time to do some magic. Though he wasn't aware of it, the light in his eyes burned bright as he strode back toward danger. Any reservations Tyron had about the Star Wolf Dove had lent him faded after the first hour. In that time he was found by roving packs of Riftkin not once, but twice, and each time the vicious summon had ripped them apart in short order. He wasn't keen to get close enough to check, but judging by eye alone, he'd come to the conclusion that the wolf's fangs were longer than this leg was thick even at the thigh. He'd managed to recover a few cores at least, putting his butchery skills to good use. If he were ever allowed back into Woodsedge, they'd sell for a good price. Perhaps he could get Dove to sell them for him. He dismissed the thought. The summoner had been true to his word so far, but that doesn't mean Tyron was about to hand over his money. The frequency of the attacks had shocked him at first. When he reflected on it, he felt that he'd been underestimating just how much work Aril and Rogel had done for the team while they were out, avoiding groups they didn't want to fight, and keeping the group safe. He had no such protection, and would have to blunder through as best he could. I'll leave the heavy lifting to my undead army, he wryly thought to himself. Dreams of a legion of undead servants felt a long way off when he didn't have so much as a single minion to his name nor even a finger bone to work on. Soon, he would fix that. After another hour, he came to the first location he had marked on his map, with only one more stop along the way. This was the furthest site from the rifts he'd found. 
and hopefully it would provide enough for him to raise a minion, or at least get close. It took longer than he'd wanted to get the exact location, his map wasn't nearly as precise as he would have liked, but eventually he found it. The dried brush crunched under his shoes as he approached the tree. Looking down on the two skeletons huddled together at the base, vines and moss creeping through the gaps between bones. He didn't know the story behind these two. Couldn't guess why or how they'd come to be here, together at the time of their death. But it didn't matter to him, and he pushed such concerns from his mind. He had a limited amount of time to work with, and he couldn't afford to waste it. Study, document, gather and move on, he told himself as he squatted down beside the bones. Keep an eye out, please. He asked the wolf, who studiously ignored him as it prowled impatiently amongst the trees. No harm in trying to be polite, he shrugged. Alright then, better try this. As he had the night he'd been on watch, he extended a tendril of magic toward the remains, and began to attempt to saturate them, letting his own energy seep in. It was slow and taxing, but eventually he felt the same response as before, the duck-tinged force that pushed back at him. In fact, it felt stronger here, and he leaned closer to see if he could find out why. Not that getting closer did anything to help, since he was sensing through his magic, but he did it anyway. He frowned. The more he concentrated, the more he felt the energy within the bones was active, as if it were moving, or resonating, but on such a small scale as to be almost impossible to detect. He withdrew his probe and instead pushed it toward the other set of remains. After five minutes of careful application of energy, he found the same phenomenon, but the movement seemed to be in a different direction. He puzzled over it in his head before realization came, and he palmed his face in exasperation. The two sets of remains were sharing energy with each other, of course the movement would feel different, it was going in opposite directions. The amount was so minute that he never would have felt it, if not for his unseen granted affinity for death magic, which this energy had to be. This most likely explained how natural undead occurred. In a place with enough death, enough remains and sufficient magic, the energy would be shared amongst the corpses, magnifying over time, until it became sufficiently saturated that the bodies rose of their own accord, fueled by the death energy they contained. Such creatures were almost always bound to the location in which they were created, since they had no other source of magic to draw on, unlike his own minions, who he sustained with his own reserves. But that also posed certain questions. Since it was possible for undead to share magic between each other, would it be possible for him to create the same feedback loop in his own minions? Or perhaps devise a way for them to draw on energy in the environment when it was available? Come to think of it, if he were to simply provide a set of bones sufficient death magic, would he be able to then perform a much simpler version of Ray's dead? since he would only need to create the conduit and mind construct rather than fuel the process from the get-go. Too many questions for which he didn't have answers and didn't have time to learn. He shook his head in frustration. Having to use shortcuts and half-baked methods rubbed him the wrong way, but he had no choice at the moment. He bit back his negative feelings and started to go over both skeletons. He needed to know which bones were here and which were missing before he could pack them away. By the time he set up camp for the night he wanted at least one full set he could raise for the second day. Chapter 30 The cave barely deserved the name, only 10 meters deep from the narrow entrance. But it provided the space he needed for his work sheltered from the environment. Luckily he'd caught a glimpse of the entrance behind a split boulder as he was walking past. The Star Wolf pointedly refused to enter first, no matter how it was cajoled. So he crept in, a magic bolt held at the ready just in case but the inside was surprisingly roomy and blessedly free from Riftkin. A few light spells later, and he had a dark, damp hole in the ground he could use for his work. I suppose it's fitting, in a way. Necromancers were probably forced to operate in these sorts of conditions whenever they popped up. Even so, this was a still a downgrade from his first workspace, which was a tomb. How is it even possible to downgrade from a tomb? Yet he'd managed it somehow. With a weary sigh he slung his pack off his shoulders and slumped onto the uneven floor. With a groan he tried to rub some life back into his legs without success. Before he drank what little remained of his water and chewed on some preserved meat. It had taken the better part of the remaining sunlight to gather the materials that he needed and store them here. The tension from traveling under constant threat of attack, his fear of discovery by a slayer team his existing fatigue from being on patrol, 
had all built up to the point his chest felt constricted from the stress. Even worse was the physical fatigue. Once again he thanked the Unseen for the constitution he gained from both the Necromancer and Anathema classes. Without it he'd have collapsed days ago. No rest for the wicked, as father would say. Better get back to it. Muscles creaked as he crawled over to his pack and removed the last few bones he needed. With great care, he carried them to the only flat section within this hollow where two skeletons had been laid out side by side. The two sets of remains had been the closest to complete he could find, while staying as far as possible from the rifts. It was frustrating that he still didn't have an accurate picture of the exact bones, and their placement in the human body, which was a glaring lapse that he had to correct as soon as possible. No matter how good he became at bone stitching or casting rays dead, his minions would still perform poorly if they were missing parts that they needed to move properly. It grated on him immensely that he was still so poor at his craft. He had sacrificed everything for it. He had to be as close to perfect as it was humanly possible to be, otherwise he would fail. The standards that his parents had reached were impossibly high. But if he didn't aim to climb that high, then he might as well surrender himself now, and not go through all this pain. In the dim light of the cave, Tyron grit his teeth and placed the bones as best he could, before straightening and examining his work. As far as he could tell, the skeletons were complete, but he couldn't be sure. No matter what he wanted, things weren't going to get better than this. So he leaned forward once more, his fingers flexing as ghostly strings of magic began to dangle from his fingertips. It was painstaking work, and Tyron was forced to take regular breaks to massage his fingers and refocus his mind. It took him six hours to complete it, and by the end he was filled with mixed emotions. The quality of the threads may have improved since last time but his condition was so poor that he felt the work wasn't up to standard. He had the skills and the levels now to produce a much finer result, but he was so pressed for time. He bit his lip hard before he was finally able to push his emotions down. This wasn't the time. He needed a cool head if he was going to succeed. He had a golden opportunity in front of him, and if he squandered it, there likely wouldn't be another. It was close to the middle of the night by this time, so he wrapped his cloak around himself and grabbed his pack for use as a pillow. The stone floor was uncomfortable to say the least, and despite his shattering fatigue, he couldn't sleep knowing the Rivkin roamed outside of the cave even if he had the Star Wolf watching over him. As usual, he was forced to cast magic on himself to rest even if only for a few hours. It was still before dawn when he woke, and despite the protests of his muscles or the pounding in his head, he pushed himself to standing with an eager smile on his face. Time for magic. Time for minions. He chuckled to himself before he stumbled and caught himself on the uneven floor. He had a new series of aches and pains where stones had jabbed into his sides and hip as he slept. But he did his best to ignore them as he rummaged in his pack for his notebook. He conjured a few fresh globes of light and began to flick through the diagrams, invocation patterns and various theories he'd scratched across the pages. His eyes took it all in before he snapped the volume shut and carefully returned it to his pack. It was time. He strode forward with confidence and stood at the head of the first skeleton. He paused, took a breath, and then raised his hands before he began to speak. He wished he had more time. He wished he could have conducted more research on how to infuse the bones with magic, or investigated the strange resonance they exhibited, but he couldn't. He only had another day before Dove's summon would vanish, and he would be left on his own. In order to protect himself from that point on, he had to have minions. The words rolled sonorously from his mouth as his hands moved in broad gestures. He hadn't been wasting his time as he waited on the side of Victory Road. He'd spent every quiet moment thinking of only one thing, Ray's dead. His signature magic, his golden ticket. He had to make every improvement he possibly could. For an hour he cast without pause, straining every bit of arcane energy within himself, and pouring all of it into the bones on the cave floor in front of him until finally the spell was complete. A dark purple light grew within the hollow eyes of the skull, and once again he felt that tenuous connection form between himself and another entity, servant to his will. Finally, he wearily sighed, a slight smile edging the corners of his mouth. He paused to catch his breath and stretch before he pulled out a piece of mage candy, 
and popped it in his mouth. He was running low of the precious stuff and couldn't afford to replace what little he had. But he needed to squeeze as much work into the next day as he possibly could. He sat and rested for 10 minutes before he began the second cast, utilizing all of his focus and magic to perform Ray's dead once more. The glittering form of the Star Wolf watching with unblinking eyes from the side. When the cast was complete, Tyron collapsed to his knees, drained of all his reserves. He drew ragged breaths into his dry and burning throat, allowing the now empty chunk of arcane crystal to fall from his mouth to the cave floor. He extended a shaking hand and gathered it up. No need to leave any evidence of his presence if he didn't have to. When he could, he pushed himself back to his feet, gathered his pack and slung it back over his shoulder, staggering under the weight of it. I'm a mess. His eyes were raw from lack of sleep, his hands trembled, and he rasped with every breath. He really was scraping against his limits, but it would be worth it, after all. Rise, he said. There was no need to say it out loud. The minions would respond to mental commands through the link that they shared, but he felt compelled to speak. The light in the eyes of the undead ignited as they drew on his magic, the bones pulling themselves together and moving with eerie silence. With slow, deliberate movements, Tyron drew his sword and passed it to the closest skeleton. The skeletal fingers closed around the hilt, and he felt the drain on his reserves increase, as it exerted strength to hold the blade aloft. Time to head out, minions. I need to level up. Don't talk to the minions, idiot. I'm way too tired. It was dangerous, but he needed to make the most of his time until the Star Wolf left him. By the end of the day, he hoped to have retrieved more remains and have fought enough Rivkin to level his necromancer class to 5. Perhaps his first class feat would give him a clearer path forward. The skeletons staggered out of the cave first, and Tyron followed behind, the wolf emerging last of all. The strange group gathered themselves together and made their way out into the woods. Back in Wood's Edge, Dove allowed the glow to fade from his eyes, as he ceased to share the senses of his wolf. He let out his breath explosively as he slumped back in the bath. The kid was mad, completely fucking mad. Or perhaps he possessed a set of balls so large he didn't need a chair. He just folded those bad boys back, and plonked his backside on them. Actually, that raised a question. At what point did recklessly large nads just become insanity? Casting such complex ritual magic in that condition Dove could only shake his head. Even in his wild and carefree youth, when he'd felt invincible and nothing would ever harm him, he wouldn't have tried it. Not for a million gold imperials. Then again, his circumstances had never been as desperate as the kids. For the hundredth time he wondered if he'd done the right thing not reporting Tyron. Turning over the child of two heroes just because he wanted to keep the class he was given seemed monstrous. But if Dove was honest with himself, it wasn't anything strange. In fact, it happened all the time, every year a swath of poor helpless saps would try to hold onto their forbidden class, and some would escape, but most wouldn't. There were only two points that separated Tyron's case from the masses. The class he received, and who his parents were. Realistically, what would happen if he turned him over? Having a class burned out was supposed to be excruciatingly painful. Not to mention leaving the individual crippled, unable to take a new main class, except in rare cases. There wouldn't be anything like that for the kid, though. The first thing Dove had done on returning to town, was check the warrant posted for his capture. No second chances for the son of the Steelums. He was for the chop as soon as he was brought in. And what would those two do once their precious bouncing baby boy was executed by the people they protected all their lives? It wasn't hard to guess. Everyone had heard about what they'd done in Foxbridge. Finding someone not gossiping about it was fucking impossible at the moment. When they found out who had turned the kid in, they'd burned the place to a fucking cinder. He had no doubt. As the only two top-ranked slayers in the entire province, there wasn't a single soul who could stop them outside of the capital. By the time the brand brought them down, they would have slaughtered an entire city. If someone wanted to turn the kid in, they better spend that reward money as fast as possible they wouldn't have long to enjoy it. Which was probably the whole point of their display in Foxbridge. They wanted everyone to know what would happen if they went against their son. The thought of going against the brand to that extent made Dove shrivel to nothing. The pain it gave him was soul crushing when he brushed against the vows, if he outright violated them. He literally couldn't imagine how bad it would be. Monsters, he muttered to himself. 
Swearing softly, then loudly to himself, he pulled himself out of the bath and started to dry himself. No matter how he twisted this, something just didn't add up right. How the hell had Tyron ended up getting such a rare and dangerous class? There were rumors that the process of awakening could be influenced through the crystals. But Dove had always considered that to be conspiracy theory bullshit. But now he had reason to pause. If it were true the implications would be absolutely boggling. It would almost make sense though, another lever of control the Magisters could level against the population. But if it were true, why would Tyron be targeted? Because of his parents. That didn't make sense either. They'd done more in the war against the Rifts than anyone. Dove paused for a second. Yes, literally fucking anyone. When he thought about it. Most slayers who reached their level of power retired to palaces and only came out in emergencies. Living lives of luxury, unlike the Steelums who just kept ripping through rifts with barely a day off. The number of slayers who owed their lives to a last second rescue from those two was in the thousands. The skinny summoner shook himself like a dog. I don't fucking know. He roared to nobody in particular before he started to get dressed with angry, jerking movements. Rather than some ridiculous conspiracy. It was more likely the kid was just a natural necromancer, and the Unseen had given him the class best suited to him. The reborn god of fucking magic. After seeing the kid in action for himself, he had to admit he hadn't been far off the mark. Considering his piss poor level and lack of stats, Dove couldn't deny that Tyron was a natural mage. His pronunciation was perfect, his control of diction, volume and tempo, flawless. That stuff was such a bitch to get right. He could remember the endless days and nights he'd spent reading the words of power out loud, getting clobbered over the head every time he tripped over a syllable. And the kid was self-taught. Absolute bullshit. Being born with that kind of talent was unfair. Not to mention the focus and concentration required to cast in that condition. Absolute fucking bullshit. Monster he muttered to himself. Then he laughed out loud. He was just a little baby monster right now, but if he managed to raise his class over the level 20 threshold and advance it, then something truly incredible might be born. If that happened who knows what the response would be from the higher ups. It'd be like dropping a fire stone into a pot of stew. Dove loved stirring the pot. Fully dressed, he rushed out of the bathroom and passed a surprised looking maid before he barreled into the common room and out into the street. He told the kid he'd give him a supply drop, and so that was exactly what he was going to do. Food, water, mage candy, fresh paper, camping gear, outdoor gear, all at the finest quality available in town. He even yoinked a few supplies from the Slayer Keep, just for the irony. By the time he was done he'd amassed a small mountain of gear and spent half his savings, which frankly he didn't give a shit about. Saving was for the future, and people with a future were fucking cowards. He was immensely pleased with himself as he looked down on the neatly tied packages he'd stacked in a pile in the common room of his team's suite. Dove, Rogel asked from the doorway of his room, a resigned look on his face. What in the hell are you up to now? Dove grinned. Being a pain in someone's ass, he declared proudly. Rogel grunted. Same as every other day then. You fucking know it. Out near the rifts Tyron dragged himself through the narrow cave entrance before he collapsed on the other side, panting. It was a miracle he hadn't been seen, and frankly, it had been the height of idiocy to go roaming around with a pair of skeletons on his heels. However, he'd succeeded, somehow. He shrugged off his pack and fell backwards, as his two minions silently stalked in behind him, followed by the Star Wolf. The two skeletons were both somewhat banged up, bones cracked some completely split, and there was nothing he could do for them. He'd managed to secure enough remains to produce another two skeletons, hopefully, as well as scavenge some rusted weapons that they could hopefully use to some effect. He had almost six hours until he would need to leave and make his way back to meet up with Dove. Hopefully the summoner would be true to his word, Tyron hadn't managed to find anything to drink, since he'd left the cave, and his throat ate something fierce. He would need to drink and eat soon, but first, he had to sleep. When he woke, he could perform the status ritual. And if the gods were kind, raising his current minions and the fighting they'd done would be enough to push him to level 5. Not that he could depend on the gods right now. Sleep, Tyron muttered, and immediately his eyes fluttered shut as the spell took hold and dragged his consciousness away. Sorry to say, but this is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your support and kind comments. Have a wonderful rest of the day. The silent rupt is out.